The Tuesday, June 2nd, 2020, electronic meeting of the Ann Arbor Planning Commission. This meeting is in accordance with the executive order from the governor to affect social distancing and mitigate the spread of COVID-19 virus. We intend to conduct this meeting similarly to an in-person meeting. However, please be patient if there are any technical issues. Public comment will be available via telephone only. To speak during any of the public comment opportunities, please call 877-853-5247 and enter the meeting ID 926-3370-3308. This information is also available on the published agenda in the public notices section of the city website and on the broadcast of this uh, meeting on CTN channel 16, AT&T, or I'm sorry, yeah, AT&T channel 99 and online at www.a2gov.org slash watch CTN. And we'll begin the meeting this evening with the roll call. Commissioner Woods. Here. Commissioner Briggs. Here. Commissioner Mills? Commissioner Milstein? Here. Commissioner Gib Randall? Here. Commissioner Ackerman? Here. Commissioner Sove? Here. Commissioner Abrams? Here. Commissioner Hammerschmidt? Here. We have a quorum. Thank you. Do we have any introductions this evening? Uh, we have one. Um, joining us later, we will um, have Cynthia Redinger, um, a transportation engineer for the city. Um, both of our petitions this evening had um, some traffic related questions and so um, she's available to address any questions that may come up. Great, thank you. Um, do I have a commissioner that will move the agenda? Moved by Commissioner Briggs, seconded by Commissioner Woods. Um, any discussion or changes to the agenda? Seeing no one, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? It is approved. Um, before us this evening, we have the May 19th, 2020 uh, meeting minutes that we received uh, momentarily ago. Um, do yeah, I if you, and I would just say they were provided quite late. If you haven't had a chance to review them, it's perfectly okay to uh, postpone consideration of those to the following meeting. All right. Do I, do I have a commissioner that will move uh, the minutes? Moved by Commissioner Ackerman, seconded by Commissioner Gibrandall. Do we have any discussion on the meeting minutes? Commissioner Briggs? I just, I only got a chance to skim like the first page, so I'm not sure. Would you like to move to postpone? I'll move to postpone if others are in the same place that I am. I'll second that. Okay. Seconded by Commissioner Abrams. Any discussion on the postponement? All those in favor, please say aye to postpone. Aye. Opposed? All right, postponed. Um, moving on to reports from city administration, city council, planning manager, planning commission officer committees. And we'll begin with our city council representative, uh, Commissioner Ackerman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, city council met last night and a few updates uh, relevant to this body that I'd like to share with you. Um, the first was with respect to our ongoing initiatives to close sidewalk gaps. Um, traditionally, the city has funded uh, building sidewalks where there aren't any today by assessing property owners on which the, the sidewalk gap exists. So, um, you know, there, there are issues with that. They are general social good. It puts in, you know, a significant burden on that exact location. Um, and so to explore other funding mechanisms, city council asked staff um, to develop a potential ballot language for a sidewalk gap millage. So in addition to renewing our um, street bridge and sidewalk millage that we've traditionally had um, in November of 2020 for five years, we would also consider an additional 0.2 millage for install the installation of sidewalk that doesn't exist today. Um, the exact language of that um, of the, the ballot initiative would be, it, it is what we've asked staff to develop and they'll get back to us in July with a few options for our consideration. Um, so big thanks to staff for their proactive work. It's been a topic of conversation at the city council table for some time, um, but it's just kind of languished as an idea uh, until they brought this back. Um, so very grateful for, for them moving the ball forward. Um, 
Additionally, City Council did adopt the A20 carbon neutrality plan last night. Um, this is a seven strategy living document, meaning that it's not signed and sealed last night. It's going to change and evolve as we learn more about the latest science, the latest technology, and changes in federal state regulation and funding, uh, as well as our partnership with DTA will evolve certainly as well over the next 10 years. Um, just as a preview, these seven strategies include powering our electric grid with 100% renewable energy, switching our appliances and vehicles from gasoline, diesel, propane, and natural gas to electric, significantly improving the energy efficiency in our homes, businesses, schools, places of worship, recreational sites, and government facilities, reducing the miles we travel in our vehicles by at least 50%, which includes some land use and zoning changes, changing the way we use, reuse, and dispose of materials, enhancing the resilience of our people and our place, and a general catch-all strategy that captures miscellaneous uh, actions that don't filter into one of the other six. Um, so very exciting step forward, a huge development for our new Office of Sustainability and Innovation, uh, led by Dr. Missy Stoltz, um, who will be um, fully funded in her budget this coming year to start making headway on this uh, very progressive and landmark plan. Um, the, Final item I wanted to share with you is that City Council did approve a resolution to um, close downtown streets in consultation with the business associations uh, to allow outdoor dining um, at, at our local restaurants in our downtown. So soon we'll be releasing more detailed plans, uh, which I'm sure you'll be able to read about in the media. And I encourage folks to come out and support um, local businesses uh, who have been hurting pretty bad over these last few months. Uh, of course, practicing uh, the safety precautions that we need to keep you and your family safe. Thank you. Um, Mr. Leonard, do you have a report for us? Um, just following up on um, uh, Commissioner Ackerman's report from City Council, um, the transportation team has been doing great work in that regard. Um, I wanted to share with you and the public um, the Healthy Streets program information. Um, it's a website available at the city at a2gov.org slash healthy streets. Um, this has a lot of information about um, how the city is approaching this. Um, additionally, there's a public input tool um, that provides uh, information uh, or where you can submit information about your interest um, in, in a particular geography or type of uh, response uh, for healthy streets. So some great resources. Uh, um, apart from that, uh, the working session um, scheduled for um, next week will be um, a, a bit of a um, a bit of a uh, hodgepodge. Um, um, in, in addition to the um, A20 uh, document that um, Commissioner Ackerman just referenced, um, I'm going to invite uh, Dr. Missy Stoltz or and her team to provide a brief overview of what that document says um, to get you start to thinking about how it may or may not relate to land use policy going forward. I'm also gonna invite in Deb, um, one, of our, one of mine, one of your favorites who uh, runs our capital improvements program um, to give you a snapshot of where that process is sort of midstream. Um, if you have any questions about what's happening, I know it's typically you only see that sort of leading up to adoption. So this is an opportunity for a checkpoint. Um, and then um, in addition to healthy streets, um, I'm gonna invite a plan, transportation planner, Eli Cooper, to talk about the Healthy Streets Initiative in a little bit more detail, as well as the status of the city's update to the transportation plan. And that's all I have. And I'm sorry, Mr. Winter. Uh, also, Planning Commission reviewed some cosmetic changes to the UDC that clarifies distinctions between what is requested in site plans and area plans. If you recall, City Council passed that at first reading um, and hopefully that will move forward at second reading as well. Great, thank you. Um, any uh, Planning Commission officers and committees, any reports this evening? Okay, see no one. Uh, we'll move on to audience participation. Um, this is an opportunity for persons to speak for up to five minutes about an issue that is not listed in the public hearings on this agenda. So this is, you can speak to the Planning Commission about anything other than the Valhalla and the Liberty Project. 
Uh, to comment on such other matters other than Valhalla and the Liberty Project, please call 877-853-5247 and enter meeting ID 926-3370-3308 this information is also displayed on the meeting agenda and the video feed. City staff will select callers that have raised their hand one by one using the last three digits of your phone number. In order to electronically raise your hand to indicate your desire to speak, please press star nine on your phone. You'll hear an automated announcement once the host is allowing you to speak. When speaking, please move to a quiet area and mute any television or background sounds so that we may, we may hear you clearly. Please state your name and address at the beginning of your comments. So this is the time for anybody to speak about any subject other than the two petitions that we have before us this, e this evening. So you're, you are able to speak about anything um, other than Valhalla and the Liberty Project. Mr. Leonard, do we have any? Yes, a caller with phone number ending with 500. You have three minutes to address the Planning Commission. I'm sorry. I push the wrong button. I wanted to talk about Valhalla. I didn't okay. Say that under okay. Me. Sorry, there'll guys. An, nope. There'll be another I'll opportunity for that. I'll call back. Sorry. No other indication of speakers. Okay. Thank you. Um, all right. Moving on to public hearings for next business meeting. Mr. Leonard. Yes, we have, uh, uh, three primary agenda items. Um, one is uh, the return of 2800 Jackson Road. Uh, the, it's a site plan for two hotels. Uh, the petitioner has followed up on some of the uh, requests to reevaluate um, the interaction with the right of way and some landscaping, proposed landscaping changes. Um, then we have two new items appearing on your agenda. One is the uh, proposed site plan for city council for a home to hotel. This is a proposal to demolish an existing building and construct a four story uh, hotel with 115 rooms on a 2.6 acre parcel located at 361 West Eisenhower Parkway. Um, it will include a 115 car parking lot and two driveways that access onto Signature Boulevard. Um, then we also have a uh, item for a series of rezonings. Um, the city has um, had submitted earlier uh, or last year uh, a set of proposed annexations of properties from Sio Township, Pittsfield Township, and Ann Arbor Township. Um, while about a hundred of those properties were submitted, only um, uh, about only 26 of those were approved by the state. Um, so uh, those are all from Sio Township. We are proposing to rezone those properties. Um, so bear with me. Um, they, uh, the properties in question are 560, 570 Allison Drive, 404 Barber Avenue, 410 Barber Avenue, 2570, 2576, 2582, 30, and 3214 Dexter Road, 2510 Miller Road, 410 Parkwood Street, and 2565 and 2850 Valley Drive. All these properties are proposed to be zoned from Township to R1C, single family dwelling. Then 3428 Porter and 147, 167, 175, 225, 235, 255, 261, 363, 367, and 371 South Wagner Road as well as 153 Westover, 221 Westover, and 260 Westover are being proposed to, are proposed for rezoning from township to R1D single family zone. Thank you for letting me get through. Thank you, Mr. Leonard. And Commissioner Woods, you have your hand up? Yes. Um, so Mr. Leonard, it sounded like a lot of things were not approved. Is that correct? And yes. uh, can you give us a sense of what happens with those properties at this point? Sure. Um, at this point, they still remain in the adjacent townships. Um, I think um, uh, Jeff Kahn from our team uh, is working with uh, folks from public services um, on sort of what the next steps of that process are for those properties, if there's any sort of subsequent appeal or further dialogue with the state regarding that. Um, but, but the short answer for the interim is, um, if that decision just stands, then those properties would remain in the townships uh, and, and then we would reconsider them with any future annexation petitions, either 
if the city reinitiated in some different capacity or if the property owners themselves elected to annex. So in this case, the property owners themselves were not requesting it? Correct. The city was initiating these annexations. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. All right. Moving on, on our, in our agenda to item 9, um, unfinished business. Valhalla Ann Arbor site plan, annexation and rezoning for city council approval. Our procedure okay. this evening uh, will be a presentation from the petitioners for uh, them to speak and present their project for up to 10 minutes. It will then be followed up by a staff report from Mr. Kowalski, uh, followed by a public hearing and then discussion. And just give me a moment. We have uh, quite a few project representatives that I am going to add to the meeting. Hello. Hello. Uh, we're just loading it up. So one quick second uh, while we put all the petitioners or yeah, all the petitioners and representatives. So we sh we'll be getting started momentarily. Mr. Leonard, is that everybody? Um, I think so. Just give me a moment. I'm trying to uh, get the presentation pulled up here for us. Sounds good. I don't see our uh, traffic engineer coming up. Nor do I see our civil engineer coming up. Uh, Todd's there. There he is. There's Julie. All right, are we ready to go, Mr. Leonard? I am, are you ready to go, Mr. Moore? Yep. All right, um, all right, we will begin with our presentation. Mr. Moore, take it away. You have 10 minutes uh, along with your team to address the Planning Commission this evening. Uh, Mr. Leonard, cut me off at six minutes so that uh, Brad Strader, our planner, can have the time after that. Uh, I think I can fit everything in, we'll see. Um, I'm Brad Moore with J. Bradley Moore and Associates Architects. I'm here on behalf of the Valhalla Project team. I have with me tonight representatives of the development group, uh, as well as my co-architect for the project, HLR Architects, and other members of the development team, including our civil engineer, Todd Pasco with Atwell, our planner, Brad Strader, Eric with Catalyst Partners, our energy consultant, who can speak to the sustainability aspects of our project, especially as compared to single family uses, our traffic uh, consultant, uh, Julie Kroll, and others. Uh, Bob Lampkin is here tonight representing HLR. Bob and I graduated together from the U of M Architectural College here. And uh, one of our last uh, co-projects, you may remember, is 615 South Main. So we look forward to reprising our success. Uh, we've all worked very diligently um, for nearly a year now um, to uh, craft the proposal that's uh, for you now. 
Um, I'm going to have to move quickly to cover a lot of ground, so uh, I apologize for the brevity, but I had the time I have. Uh, this is a quick location map uh, showing where the project is in the southwest quadrant of the city. It is highlighted with the red dashes. It is located north of Briarwood and south of Big House. Next. This is uh, the next slide is a quick aerial view, a uh, contemporary uh, shot recently. This shows the site um, as it uh, lays near uh, Bush's Market across the street and surrounded by the U of M golf course on three sides. Um, next slide. This shows some historic context for the site. This is just after World War II, about 1947 when land development patterns were starting to change in the south side of town from the traditional agricultural uses. You can see some of the farmland is being carved up into uh, single family lots, uh, both west and south of the U of M golf course. Next. Um, this shows the 17 existing parcels, uh, all but two of which are in Pittsfield Township. This project will result in the voluntary annexation of these parcels, that be no quote unquote forced annexations. Uh, most of these are on well and septic. The next slide, um, I uh, want to speak to the fact that um, the about a decade ago, um, the city council uh, created a new zoning district called R4E. This classification was intended to accommodate additional density within the city while fostering more sustainable forms of development. Um, they didn't rezone any land when they created this uh, new zoning district. It was anticipated that land already zoned otherwise would be rezoned or land that was annexed into the city would carry this new zoning. Um, the, uh, they set forth in their creation of this zoning district uh, some significant criteria to make parcels eligible for this uh, R4E zoning, uh, including uh, they had to be on a significant transit corridor into the city that had a bus service route. Uh, had to have access to public land, schools, shops, and services, all while having a low impact on adjacent property. And we believe the Valhalla project meets all of these criteria. Uh, this map before you describes some of the uh, <clears throat> services and shops in the area, as well as development patterns in the area. Brad Strader will speak more at length about this particular slide. Next. This shows the site relative to the 5, 15, and 30 minute walking radius, as well as to the designated bike routes through the city. It's an eminent, eminently walkable site. Um, services right across the street. Uh, 15 minute walk puts you to the U of M Stadium. Um, and 22 minutes, by the way, it takes is what it takes to get to Washtenaw Dairy uh, by my stride. Um, next slide. This shows the site's proximity to the parks that are on the southwest side of Ann Arbor. There are plenty of public lands available uh, to people within walkable distance. Uh, go ahead to the next slide. This shows the site's proximity to the city's bus system. There are two bus lines that go right past the system, which connect it uh, via several other stops to all the other uh, routes available in the city. Next. And this slide shows that uh, this, the university bus service is also in a walkable distance just down at Stadium Boulevard. So you could connect to the university bus service as well. Next. Um, <clears throat> this slide shows in blue, the new pedestrian access we're providing to connect the site both to the intersection at Silo Church Road and down to Ann Arbor Saline Road, and also to the sidewalk along the old Main Street Spur. We have two entrances to the building uh, to the project rather, one is off the old Main Street spur to the south uh, west corner and the other is on the curve or the bend along uh, that transition on uh, Main Street there. That's a right in and right out only designation. And then on the north side of the site, there's an emergency access uh, only connection uh, for the fire department. Next. The, uh, this is an overlay from Atwell that shows uh, the significant- yeah, About a minute, Brad. Yep, this shows the significant landmark trees. We organized the site to try to preserve the landmark trees that had a score of 25 or higher. And that's, uh, that what, that's what drove where we put the larger buildings so we could sneak the smaller buildings in uh, between the trees. The townhouse buildings are snuck in between the trees. The parking is largely tucked underneath the uh, buildings. We use the site topography to that advantage. Uh, the next series of slides are a variety of 3D perspectives. We can just click through these pretty quickly, uh, Brett. 
uh, we can come back to them as the planning commissioners desire. They show the, the project in its context with the surrounding golf course and the uses in the area like the Bush's Shopping Center across the street. Uh, also shows the elements of the buildings, including exterior patios, canopies, outdoor courtyards. The large building also has an interior courtyard. Um, and we can discuss these at length if the commissioners have an interest. These are a very similar palette of materials to the yard. These are the townhouse buildings, the smaller buildings set in amongst the landmark trees. We included a, a large play structure for recreation outside the buildings. Keep going. This is a picture of the outside of the yard, our last collaboration that Bob uh, Lampkin and the HLR and I did. Uh, for those of you, uh, some of you are probably still on the Planning Commission back then. It's not that old a project. I didn't know if you'd had a chance to see the interior courtyard shots. So I included some of the interior courtyard shots to give you uh, guys a, an idea of the level of amenities provided to the residents on the interior courtyards, which you never see on the exterior renderings because they're exterior renderings. Now I'd like uh, Brad uh, Strader to speak about the planning concepts that uh, he wrote a letter to you guys about. We're not able to hear you. Nope, still can't hear you. Brad, would you like to try calling into the phone number? Yeah, I'll do that. Oh, oh we heard you. We just we heard, heard you. you. Okay, great. Sorry. Hopefully that doesn't eat into my time. Um, I'll try to go quick. Again, Brad Streeter, MKSK. And uh, I was brought on by the development team after we got the initial staff report to look at the implications of the master plan and future land use map. And as Brett can tell you, I have over 30 years of experience in master planning and zoning, including some work in Ann Arbor. I actually did the Pittsfield Township master plan years ago. Just to have a few key points to make and summarize the letter that I prepared. One is that this is a unique situation because the properties are being annexed from Pittsfield into the city of Ann Arbor. So it's not really a rezoning. So back when the master plan was done, the South Area plan in 1990, it had specific recommendations for a number of the properties in the South area, but not this one. So this one was shown as single family in the master plan because that's what it was for decades in Pittsfield with the anticipation that when the property owners came in for annexation that the city would look at the appropriate zoning. So that's where we are now. Um, so when the city designated the site for single family, it was not really based on analysis like was done for 12 specific uh, sub areas but just because that was the existing land use with the expectation when the property owners come in, then you would look at appropriate zoning. When you look at this property, it really doesn't have the characteristics of the other high quality single family neighborhoods in the city. It doesn't have parks, it doesn't have sidewalks. The cul-de-sac length needed would be over 900 feet and the city standard is 600 and so forth. So it's really not uh, set up for single family in the city of Ann Arbor. And also single family along this corridor is inconsistent, I believe, with many of the policies in the city's various planning documents. So when a future land use map is outdated, in this case, it was 30 years ago, 1990, that the future land use was looked at here. What are the factors the Planning Commission should consider? And I do a lot of training for the Michigan Association of Planning and MML, and the factors we say are looking at land use needs, land use trends in the area, the appropriate location, and so forth. And uh, just hitting a couple key points, there is obviously a need for more housing and housing choices and this type of housing in the city of Ann Arbor. If you look at this map, other zoning decisions over the years based on the South Area Plan did not follow the future land use recommendation. Most of the decisions allowed multiple family as is being requested here. This is a good site for multiple family as Brad Moore went through. We're on a, a route for transit. We're close to the U of M transit system. We're on a 
high volume roadway. We're surrounded primarily by the golf course. There's no adjacent single family and so forth. So this really fits the criteria for good multiple family in the city of Ann Arbor. And the conditions being offered as part of this conditional rezoning for the green roof and the solar and the EV charging stations and all those different elements also help, um, we feel makes a compelling argument that this is very consistent with the city's overall planning documents. So in summary, we feel this is a really good location for this type of housing, that this type of housing is needed. It's consistent with the development trends in the area and it meets many of the goals and principles that have been in the various documents of the city council and the planning commission. With that, appreciate your time. If you have questions as we go on, I'd be happy to answer them. Thank you. Um, at this time, I'd like to welcome Mr. Kowalski for a staff report. Um, Ms. Kowalski, you may want to just unmute yourself. <laughs> okay, <laughs> thank you. Good evening, everyone. Um, I'll kind of be brief in, in a summary of what we have through our recommendations and the individual actions that you'll see here tonight. Um, as you know, there's three separate petitions associated with this project, the annexation, um, a zoning, as well as a site plan, a conditional zoning, I should say. Um, so really, as far as the annexation, I mean, staff does support the annexation. It is within our um, ultimate city boundaries. It's within the township annexation agreements. Um, so in consistent with city policy of accepting property when it is offered voluntarily for annexation, we do support the annexation of the property. Um, as far as the zoning, as you know, staff did not support the R4E zoning for this site. Um, staff is recommending kind of a, a placeholder, an, an R1D zoning. Um, when property is annexed into the city, you do need to assign a, a zoning district to that, that um, those properties. Now, it does not preclude a higher density zoning in the future uh, of going over that. And R1D right now would be consistent with land use recommendation as well as uh, the existing properties in the area right now. I believe there's four or five single family homes left on those properties. Um, those properties would be consistent with an R1D zoning. They're actually a little bit larger. R1D is a 5,000 square foot lot minimum. Um, those, the two properties there, one is zoned R1A and I believe the other one is zoned R1C, R1B. Um, so that for the zoning wise, staff would be recommending an R1D zoning. Uh, site plan, as you know, again, in, in coordination with the R, conditional R4E zoning, staff did not support the site plan at this time. Um, we have worked extensively with the petitioner from the time of submittal uh, to add uh, green features such as vegetated roofs, the uh, solar panels, um, as well as elimination of some of the extra impervious surface around the site. Uh, the fire access drive that was mentioned previously along the north side of the proposal, um, previously did have parking alongside that as well. Um, staff did urge the petitioner to remove that and, and they did. So that access drive now is solely for fire um, and not, and fire and non-motorized uh, access. Um, in addition to that, um, uh, looking through the notes right now regarding the the annex annexations we did cover that so really again in, in summary uh, although we have worked with the petitioner and uh, looking at the land use recommendation for as in conjunction with the other master plans that we have as part of the city while the land use recommendation however originally on this site did date to the original master plan of 1990 it has been reaffirmed um, with the current master plan and, and is still valid for that site. Um, so in conclusion, now staff would recommend approval of the annexation um, in R1D zoning um, and does not recommend approval of the site plan at this time. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kowalski. Um, at this time, I would like to open up the public hearing on this item. This is an opportunity for persons to speak for up to three minutes about the proposed annexation, rezoning, and or site plan for this Valhalla petition. Public comment may be made by calling 877-853-5247 and then entering meeting ID 926-3370-3308. This information is also displayed on the meeting agenda and the video feed. City staff will select callers that have raised their hand one by one using the last three digits of your phone number. 
In order to electronically raise your hand after dialing into the meeting, please press star nine on your phone. You'll hear an automated announcement once the host is allowing you to speak. When speaking, please move to a quiet area and mute any television and background sounds so that we can hear you clearly. Please state your name and address at the beginning of your comments. Caller with phone number ending with 299. You have three minutes to share your comments with the Planning Commission. Great, thank you. Uh, appreciate this opportunity to speak. I'm Michael O'Keefe at 105 Gulfview Lane. Uh, so I just want to comment that I'm not against development in my air, uh, neighborhood. We have been in this house for about 20 years and have been involved in providing feedback and support for other uh, developments that have gone on. And I find it's really been a net positive for the area as we've seen growth over the years. But I am very concerned over this particular project. And it's not the first time I and others have raised concerns. I was reviewing documents online regarding Valhalla Glen and I looked over the summary of citizen participation meeting last year. I was surprised that while it's described as a summary of comments and questions, it didn't include any of the comments raised about the density of the project. It really was just a summary of the questions people, people asked. I read through the petitioner's latest rebuttal to the Planning Commission's concerns, and, and as they say, it may be that the future land use map is outdated or has not always been followed and exceptions have been allowed for other multifamily or residential units. But really, none of those developments comes close to approaching the density that this one proposes with now 454 units for such a small footprint. I was hard to learn that the Planning Commission recommends around 80 to 90 units, um, which I support. As is, Valhalla Glen is very out of whack, really, with everything else in the area, and is much closer to what you'd expect to see for density downtown. While the traffic study said there are no issues, I'm just having a hard time seeing how there won't be issues at such an odd little intersection with the entryway so close to Sio Church and Main Street. Um, with the number of cars that would accompany this, this density of a project and the requirements of traffic being right turn in and right turn out only. I support development for Valhalla area. I think it's needed. I welcome higher density than what's there than just single residencies. Um, and I really welcome further discussion on this uh, as, a, as a neighbor, but I really hope the Planning Commission votes down this development as currently designed. Thanks for my time. Thank you. Is there anyone else who wishes to address the Planning Commission in regards to this item? If so, please press star nine to raise your hand. Caller with phone number ending in 094. You have three minutes to address the Planning Commission on the Valhalla application. I thank you. Um, you might like to know too that um, the, the meeting number that's posted on screen is not what I was able to use to get through to speak to the council. Um, it says on the screen that, that it ends in 3812. And what I actually had to do was somebody emailed me the, the correct ID, which ends in 08. I don't know if that helps anybody else or allows anybody else to speak, but just to let you know about that. Thank you. Um, so uh, generally speaking, so, Short version is I am on the other side of the golf course uh, or on the other side of the driving range. Um, I've been an owner here for 17 years. I've been the, the association president here for probably 16 years. And um, one of the things that I think as an association we're concerned about is just the, firstly, the aesthetics of what is proposed, how that would match with what is and we have 48 units here as of the moment. And um, I think the idea of the 484-ish that's being proposed, it, it, it seems wrong, basically, that when I think of the other project that's, that's been mentioned, the other projects that I see like that around town, I like them. I don't dislike them, as a matter of fact. Um, but I think that sort of thing in this location is aesthetically a little bit strange is the short way of putting that. Um, a secondary concern that I have just off the top of my head is parking that as is as a moment, um, we already have a shortage of parking here that it is a constant battle, frankly, um, especially when students are in town and, and that uh, generally speaking, students tend to take a few more spaces than uh, per 
per unit um, than just a single family actually per unit. And so parking actually is at a premium at the moment. And I can't imagine that getting better um, if a 400 plus unit place is put in very close by that right now our overflow actually goes in that direction. And as is the, 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 yeah, the (laughs) parking is already strained here. So um, the way it is structured at the moment, I appreciate the fact, I just heard that the, um, the, the current recommendation is voting against that. And I guess I'm glad to hear that. So appreciate your time. Thank you very much. Thank you. Who was that? Oh, did someone? Caller ending with phone number ending ending with 107. You have three minutes to address the Planning Commission. Hi, um, my name is Eaton Holland, and um, <clears throat> I live at 111 Golfview Lane, which is adjacent to um, the U of M property, and just across from the, pr- the proposed area of development. I want I want you to understand that I do support developing the parcel. It's really been a need of improvement for a long, long time. And a new development there would be most welcome. I do not support the developer's request for the high density zoning. I do support the R1D zoning that was recommended by the Planning Commission that would limit the number of units to 84. Um, This keeps it in line with the City of Ann Arbor's master plan. If if you were to drive through this area and take a look at our existing buildings and residences, you could easily see that there's a number of one to two story buildings, some single family homes, some condominium developments, None of them are as densely populated structures that have been proposed by the developer. Once again, I do support the 84 units. I do not support the 400 plus units proposed by the developer. It's way outside of the norm and most inappropriate for this area. Thank you. Thank you. Caller ending with phone number, phone number ending 134. You have three minutes to address the Planning Commission. Um, Thank you, Mr. Leonard. I'm Ken Garber at 28 Haverhill Court. That's on the far north side of town. I'm going to speak to the sustainability elements of this plan. I appreciate that the petitioner apparently is building to a lead silver standard and will include some solar panels, green roofs, and EV charging stations. But as Council Member Ackerman mentioned, the A20 carbon neutrality plan is now official city policy. Literally overnight, the community's expectations have changed. For example, I refer you to strategy two, dictating all electric new construction, quote, all new residential and commercial buildings are designed and built to operate without the use of natural gas, reducing the increased cost associated with retrofitting existing systems, end quote. So we'll soon have a ban on natural gas infrastructure in new construction, something many cities elsewhere have already passed and are enforcing. The A20 plan timeline shows this going into effect for us in 2022, but complete building electrification should be the default option now to avoid the need for unnecessary and costly retrofits down the road. Electrification should not add any cost to this project, according to a recent report by the Rocky Mountain Institute. It reads, for newly constructed buildings, heat pumps are universally more cost effective than natural gas, even without optimizing for demand flexibility, primarily because the heat pump provides both heating and air conditioning, avoiding the need to purchase both a furnace and an air conditioner. 
the Valhalla site plan is no longer sufficient to meet the sustainability expectations in Ann Arbor, where we're moving aggressively towards carbon neutrality and eventually a net zero emissions built environment. According to the best science and principles of global equity, the entire developed world needs to get to zero emissions by 2035 at the latest to avoid catastrophic climate change. So if staff is not already doing so, it should raise this issue with every new petitioner, including this one. So should commission. Full electrification is now the baseline community expectation, even if it is not yet required in our building code. 30 it seconds. Soon, it soon will be. Mr. Moore, Mr. Lampkin, you should revise your plans to incorporate VRF systems in your buildings and forego all natural gas infrastructure, including kitchen appliances. If you lack experience with non-fossil fuel heating systems, you should consult with local developer, Matt Grokoff, who is developing a 99 unit all electric residential project on 14 acres off Platte Road. Thank you. Thank you. Caller with phone number ending with the numbers 829. You have three minutes to address the Planning Commission. Hi, my name is Chris Pesco. I grew up on the uh, lot in question at 98 Valhalla Drive. I uh, grew up, went to Ann Arbor Public Schools, uh, Community and Pioneer High School, and then the University of Michigan School of Music and Aerospace Engineering program. Um, I will say that I uh, really uh, am interested in the, in the uh, seeing the design plans for the first time this evening. Uh, I think the proposal looks great. I like the density. I think high density uh, in this site is ideal. I grew up walking and biking um, uh, to, to all the, the uh, downtown locations that were shown in the map earlier. It's uh, highly accessible to pedestrians and, and I hope that you know people that will inhabit this area in the future don't rely entirely on cars because uh, it's a nice area to walk and bike. Um, and, and I will say, I think you know the, the amount of sprawl that's taking place currently south of the city of Ann Arbor is really an eyesore and, and really a problem for traffic and, and encouraging higher density developments like this is really the future of the city. These, you know, Ann Arbor is a city that's in position to deliver resources that the surrounding community needs from both from good schools and, uh, and, and basic, you know, necessities like libraries. Uh, uh, you know, the, the, all, the, all the great things that the University of Michigan has to offer um, these are resources that are more accessible to the public when the public's closer. Uh, so I do uh, really, uh, you know, appreciate what's been done here, the work of uh, the architects and engineers, and, uh, and would like to see this project uh, move forward as designed. Thank you. Thank you. As a reminder, if you'd like to speak on this public hearing, please press star nine on your phone to raise your hand. Caller with phone number ending with the numbers 500. You have three minutes to address the Planning Commission on the Valhalla application. Hi, my name is Stephanie Savarino. I'm very familiar with Brad Moore, who I greatly respect, and actually the developer as well. Um, I also uh, am very familiar with development, and I am I I absolutely support um, the annexation and development of the parcel. And I wanted to ask the, the Planning Commission on uh, the South, excuse me, the City of Ann Arbor Master Plan land use element, no, dated November 5th, 2009. Under, are we site two in the site, is this site two of the south area, which is saying, you know, the 65 acre site is located east of Maine, south of the U of M Golf Course, and includes 12 parcels, single family attached, multi family dwellings are recommended with additional neighborhood parkland to serve residences. Higher residential densities of up to 15 dwellings per acre can be supported if greater street access and parkland are available. If that's the case, and this is site two, why would we ever ask for more than 15 dwellings? per acre, because um, this is what the master plan, unless this is wrong, is November 5th, 2009 master plan. Do you guys know the answer to that or? 
Anybody? I'm planning. Am I not allowed to ask a question? <laughs> I'm sorry. Anyway, that's my question. I support the planning commission and their notes about um, the D R1D and and short of that, I would be willing to support something with less density as I do support development in general. It's just I cannot support this development at this location at this time. Thank you. Thank you. Not seeing any additional speakers. Okay. Thank you very much. All right, so at this time, um, we will um, head into reading the motion and uh, discussion. Mr. Leonard, I assume I'm just reading the proposed uh, uh, motion, not the alternate provided by staff? Correct. Thank you. That's, right. that, was, that was strictly provided as an alternative for your consideration. Okay. Sounds good. Um, so without objection, I'll read uh, and move both of the motions at the same time. See no objection. All right. The Ann Arbor City Planning Commission hereby recommends that the mayor and city council approve the annexation in the Valhalla Ann Arbor rezoning petition to R1E, or I'm sorry, R4E, multiple family district, based on the proposed zoning and accept these conditions. The density not to exceed 50 units per acre, the maximum height of any building will be 79 feet. The inclusion of nine affordable housing units as described in the statement of conditions. The approval is subject to executing a conditional zoning statement of conditions. Motion number two, the Ann Arbor City Planning Commission hereby recommends that the mayor and city council approve the Valhalla site plan and development agreement. Do you have a commissioner that will move? Moved by Commissioner Ackerman, seconded by Commissioner Briggs, and we are in discussion. Commissioner Ackerman. Thank you, Mr. Chair, um, and thanks to the petitioner, the residents, and staff uh, for the, the input and background. Um, I, I guess I want to turn my attention first to the, the conditions. Um, they seem somewhat loose, and I was a little confused about the nine units versus the 15 units of affordable housing. Of course, these conditions are voluntary on the petitioner's part, um, but given the scale of the rezoning request, and the fact that you're requesting only 50 units per acre, but R4E could allow up to 75 units per acre. Um, I realize that you're bringing it down, but there's just, you're kind of still asking for a pretty big box and blank slate um, without as many guarantees to the city. Um, so I guess some reconsideration of that on your part, uh, I'd be interested in. Again, of course, they're voluntary. Um, under state law, and that's completely at your discretion. Um, I, I don't know. I guess I, I'm I'm overall on the the subject of of the petition. Uh, I'm a bit torn. I, I and I feel the the tension in the staff report of seeing benefits and Mr. Kowalski and Mr. Leonard having negotiated gains along the way um, that speak to what we're trying to accomplish as a city. I was grateful to see that we got up to 12% you know, of the energy consumption of the development would be produced on site through solar. That's, that's good to see. That's so much better than so much of what's been built even in the last decade. Um, I was glad to see 15 units of affordable housing, although it's not guaranteed in the rezoning. Um, although, and, and I was a little bit confused and, and, and skeptical of the varying levels. Um, and this is housing along transit, which is totally within you know, our, our other master planning documents, and I think speaks to a lot of values that the city holds dear. Um, I guess looking to staff, um, there, there was reference to like not enough, and if you were to advise us, like wh what should we be asking for? What, what is the threshold at which staff feels as though the petitioner has put forward ideas worthy of these allowances, worthy of this increased density? Um, and where should we draw that line in, in order to you know, negotiate at the 454 units or you know, clarify some other course of action? Um, 
I don't have an exact answer. Um, mm -hmm. Whether to think through whether the magic number of sustainability features is this, this, and this, or whether the number is here. Um, I mean, we kind of react to what was given to us. So um, we did negotiate it up to basically as far as we felt we could, as far as we could get it before the project was scheduled. So, um, I mean, what I do know is again, we, we look at everything in the whole, in the whole picture and, and as we said in the staff report as well, I mean, we do feel the site could support additional density. There's, there's added value in the proposal. Um, but however, as you stated, you know, there, it's a massive increase over what the existing recommendation is for that site. And, you know, try, trying to get it closer to a point. I mean, eventually, yes, we would, we would have to make this decision where that standard is, or the planning commission ultimately obviously has to make that decision. Well, finally city council. So, so I don't have an exact answer, but I know that we weren't, staff did not feel that we were there yet as far as getting all sustainability features for housing features, any other features to um, support other elements of the master plan besides the land use recommendation. So like I said, I did think, I apologize for not giving you the exact answer. I had anticipated it yeah. and it is a good question. Okay, I, would, I appreciate if, that answer. If I, oh, yeah. if I, if I could just also add too, um, that the, the city is, has considered sort of similar um, balancing of a variety of goals in our master plans. And um, I think that uh, Mr. Kowalski has done a, um, uh, a great job in, in trying to um, recognize, recognize those at times, frankly, conflicting um, direction that comes out of that voluminous set of documents that guides our land use policy. Um, in this case, uh, however, um, it is a rezoning request. It's a conditional rezoning request, but at its core, it is a rezoning request. And um, while there is no inherent uh, uh, legal, um, clear legal link that says any rezoning must follow the recommendation of the master plan, obviously that is our advice that it, sh it should. That is the policy that we have set forth for our community goals. Um, to the extent that we are consistently applying those recommendations, um, it gives us a volume of valid decisions over a long haul that are reliable, um, in a way predictable uh, to property owners and petitioners. Um, but I would also agree with Mr. Kowalski that um, it, as it is a rezoning and as there are multiple aspects of our master plan um, beyond the, land, the future land use map, that is not um, that's not anything defined in our zoning code that says what those numbers are um, as it relates to affordable units. Um, we could look at other doc documents that do set those thresholds in our UDC, things like our PUD standards, things like our premium standards, but those would simply be proxies of other public policy or regulatory decisions based on that policy. Um, it would be looking to those thresholds for um, a more uh, discretionary decision for a rezoning. Okay, that's helpful. So um, Ms. Severino also cited a 2009 update to the land use element that cites 15 units per acre. Can you speak to the accuracy of that? Yeah, that, that's actually, so th she was, th that land, rec recommend, land use recommendation is for the site directly kind of south of that, which okay. was needed to be site two. So that's kind of, the site that includes, I believe, where she lives as well as the golf field development. So it did not include this site. Okay. Because the, the 15 acre, the 15 units per acre is denser than the R1D recommendation. So R1D would net 84 units. 15 units per acre is like 150 units. And then this is like 450 units. Um, so there, I mean, within the vicinity, there's, there is justification for going above R1D in terms of density. Um, and, and some of the neighbors to the south have, have you know, netted the benefits of that increased density. Um, so, so I, I, I do appreciate staff's perspective that this is kind of going above and beyond the density that we have experienced and allowed um, in the immediate vicinity, uh, given the master plan, and that there is this this tension and need. For added benefit with respect to um, 
to sustainability and affordable housing. Um, and I do have interest in giving staff more time to see what, what can be done with respect to those if the developer uh, is open to it. Um, I did also have some questions around staff's comments on natural features that didn't seem like fully cooked yet, um, as well as the, the transportation elements. I really appreciate Ms. Rettinger for being here. Um, thank you. Um, but uh, the I might um, I might have just not lack I might lack some imagination, but it's hard to visualize exactly what all of those recommendations look like, and then what the process and path forward to implement those would be given the need for public engagement. It seemed as if we're asking for certain things to be implemented, but there is a process that would need to unfold that would include neighbors to implement them. Um, and it, it, it felt a little bit like putting the cart before the horse in, in approving this without knowing if that process would pan out. So I had to, a few uh, points of confusion and concern there. Um, I, I want to support this. I want increased density along transit. It's something I've talked about for, for five years and it definitely speaks to, to my values um, and what I, I believe firmly our, our community needs. Um, but, but there are a few items that still seem a little undercooked and, uh, and I do, do wanna see if, if there is opportunity to increase um, sustainability measures and affordable housing. So I'll leave it there for now. I'm curious to other colleagues' thoughts. I could just really quickly speak to, you did mention a natural features review. I, that that may have, uh, I know there are engineers on the lines here somewhere still, Todd. Todd. Oh, there you go. Um, that may have been addressed. They were, there were revisions submitted late last week that our natural features coordinator did look over and um, they may have been addressed by now, but I, <laughs> So I was looking to uh, Mr. Pasco to see if he could add that response. I apologize, I, I can't go back right now and look at that, but they were communications at the end of last week. Sure, sure I can respond. Um, yeah, we, we did respond to Tiffany's comments uh, earlier, but when we did uh, resolve the interior landscape islands and the bioretention areas, we accidentally moved two trees out of the bioretention areas. Oh, right. So all we had to do is move those two trees back. Yes. Okay. That's so when the, when the staff report says minor, it's it's two trees. Yeah, I, I believe that could that's that wasn't that's not a was not a reason for denial. And okay. to the tra transportation issue as well, we do have our transportation engineer on the line. If we didn't already point that out, so yeah, no, I, I'm grateful for that. Um, I, I'll I'll let it be for for now. I am very interested in, in other colleagues' thoughts. Um, so thanks. Further discussion, Commissioner Gibrandel. I'm wondering if you could, that, that staff could address the point that the petitioner brought up about um, the fact that these sites were annexed and that they weren't really part of the master plan from before and then how your determination of the R1D was determined you know, based on the fact that it kind of wasn't, it, was, it, it sounds like by what they're saying that it was kind of default based on the fact that that's what was there, not what was necessarily envisioned for the city. So I guess corroboration as to whether you say that's accurate or not. And then R1D, like why R1D? If some of the sites around it are, um, well, it's a mix, right? There's a couple of single family homes and then there's quite a bit of multifamily. And so, um, but frankly, the, the single family homes are kind of in the minority, you know, in terms of what's around it, it character wise. So if you all could talk through those two points, I would, that would be helpful for me. Sure, I, I can start. I mean, I, yeah, the, the point that was brought up about the master plan, the origination of that, and that, that recommendation that was um, from the original plan of 1990, I, I honestly, I can't speak to that. You know, that, that was, I can't speak to how they got that recommendation. Um, you know, none of us were here at, in the 1990. I mean, typically we have when we've done we've done other master plan plan updates since that point. We do look at more than just placeholding of of land, particularly land that has a lot of vacant area like this. But I don't know how that was done in 1990. I apologize. As to the R1D designation, um, that's that was uh, one that 
we had lots of discussion as staff. As I said previously, there, there two of the parcels currently are in the city. One is R1A and I believe the other one is R1B. Um, so in the master plan ultimately does say single family. So we, we do agree that the site can support more density um, than necessarily a single family. However, with an annexation, you do need to assign a zoning district. Right. Anything other than an R1 or would require an area plan. Um, we couldn't necessarily slap an R4 on there. Um, there is other issues as well as going to possibly even an R1E. R1E has limitations on house sizes, which would make a couple of the existing houses non-conforming. Um, R1D again is supports the most dense of single family. However, again, nothing precludes that from being um, rezoned in the future to something of, of a higher density. I would, I would, I would just add on to that that uh, the notion that it was township property, and if it was, if the the master plan recommendation was somehow deferential to that existing use. Um, that may very well be the case that, um, and you could take that as a criticism of the master plan that it should have envisioned some other use. Nonetheless, it was clearly identi it was clearly master plan for single family, um, but for sure um, as uh, you know, consideration of changing factors is something to consider in deviating from those recommendations in the context of all the master land use policy. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's that's it for now. Commissioner Sobe. So I, I just want to really kind of clarify that point that the master land use plan did an overlay zoning in 1990 for the township parcels calling for it to be single family. That part of the practice of the master plan is to do an overlay on township parcels with the anticipation they might be annexed in. But I think yeah. I know what you mean. Like the correct, we would look at properties that are ultimately within the city's uh, annexation boundaries. So that okay. that is what they did at that time. Okay. So anything within the annexation boundaries was correct. one for one overlaid. Okay. Uh, I just want to make sure it wasn't kind of again looking at that vicinity thing. Um, well, I do want to kind of just. Oh, sorry. Just, I was gonna, I was going to say it is. It's worth noting that with within that same land use plan, there were other sites that were called out close to there for multifamily, as one of the callers pointed out earlier. So mm -hmm. it's not like that wasn't necessarily looked at 30 years ago. However, this site was not. There are various land use recommendations specific to sites within that plan, but this was just a continuation of the existing land use. Okay, so proximity sites that were within the city boundaries at that time were actually zoned 30 years ago to be multifamily. Well, they weren't zoned, but they were. Uh, they had recommendations. Put recommendations on to be right. zoned, yeah, to that yes. to be. And, and as as they yeah. came in, many of those sites, as referenced, and again, some of the callers lived at some or near those locations that were, in fact, built according to some of those land use recommendations. Okay. Um, kind of on that, I want to be clear that uh, with this motion, those those single family homes would wouldn't be non-conforming because it's taken together as an R4E with the um, proposed conditions of the unit type. So like if we're talking about the first motion to be R4E, is there a case in the future, if that's adopted, that those houses would stay and be non-conforming? Um. Well, uh, you do, I believe single family is a permitted use within the R4, so the R4E, so that they wouldn't be non-conforming. Those existing, so if the zoning did go through and all the mm -hmm. properties were zoned R4E, those existing houses could remain and, and say the okay. development for whatever reason doesn't go, doesn't go forward. All the properties would be zoned R4E, including the vacant properties within that, the parcels, mm -hmm. but the single family homes could remain. Okay, uh, that's helpful too. Um, and I guess I, I do want to go uh, to transportation to get clarification on both. I think the the condition that was the main condition I read that is raised about the median island in the left turn uh, for um, that Main Street entrance and 
the process that it seems that it, it might need to go through as I read the staff report, because it seems like some more work needs to happen for transportation and the additional work may require additional public engagement. So if staff could speak to all of that <laughs> and what that means to where, where the project is as proposed, uh, what changes might need to be made. Sure. The applicants transportation impact analysis recommended a, a couple of things that they recommend. First thing that we looked at was access to the site. So they have the two site accesses that are proposed. The access on Main Street is a right in right out access as a condition of the boulevard section. That boulevard section currently has an opening, thank you, Brett, that allows access to the commercial parcel that is on the other side of the street. Their transportation impact analysis, as I said, it recommended um, eliminating left turns for southbound Main Street and through movements for from that commercial driveway, we want to make sure that we aren't creating a crash pattern where individuals who are southbound on Main Street would basically make a, a U-turn there and go back to the right in, right out driveway. And instead, go down to the Ann Arbor Saline intersection and come in the site through the other, through the other access point. As part of that, um, and with the city's interest in, in having public participation processes, we wanted to make sure that the developer would go through that process with, with the public, particularly with the commercial property that is across the street. And while we, we're really want to make sure that that process happens. We also didn't want to put the public through the process if the site plan and the annexation did not get approved. So this project isn't kind of triggering a, a kind of republic process on the private parcel. It would be within the public right of way, re-engineering that boulevard on Main Street if this is adopted, that that would kind of trigger contextual changes to the traffic patterns. Yes, that's accurate. The, the changes would be as a result of the study, but it would, or as a result of the development, but all of those changes would be with the public right. And what would be this, like, what would be the lag or kind of uh, movement forward on that front if this project is approved? How, how quickly does the city mobilize in the public right away to make those changes so that that boulevard might be constructed at the same time that this property would be complete so that we have residents there and that, that uh, street improvement is done? That timeline would be, um, it would be a burden that was placed upon the developer and the developer would be funding those changes. And would that then be a condition for uh, occupancy permit that those changes in the right of way uh, are done by the developer for the property to also be approved for occupancy? Brett, please correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe that is the case. Yes, we, we could, okay. within the development agreement, the language would be specifically spelled out as to when the improvements needed to be done and uh, you know, before so-and-so, usually it's before issuance of the first CO mm -hmm. or something of that nature. So that development agreement, it's not directly in the draft that you have in front of you before, sorry, right now, but that will be in there and that's ultimately approved by council. Okay, so it, it's something that we won't see because it's in public right away and we're looking at uh, private land use, but to just know in context that that would be an additional kind of condition to this project that would need to happen. Requirement. Correct. Um, Okay, and then I guess to kind of clarify, everything on the site then looks good to go. And that that was the big kind of flag to traffic. Yes. Okay. 
Yes. Um, I guess I have, uh, I'll raise a couple of questions to the developer uh, with the public comment. Is there feasibility to do full electrification in the building plans? Um, we, we certainly are, are willing to have a discussion uh, with the, uh, our energy uh, consultant, um, HLR and I have, uh, as a matter of course, done VRF uh, heat pump heating and cooling systems. Uh, we could certainly uh, have a conversation with our energy consultant and with the ownership group as to using uh, gas appliances, gas clothes dryer, or non-gas clothes dryers, non-gas appliances. We haven't had that discussion yet, um, but we certainly uh, could have that discussion with the, the ownership group. And then I think financially, I would kind of push on the small percentage of affordable units, the nine versus the 15. Uh, would there be room to do a full 15 units at the 60% AMI instead of splitting it between those three tiers? Is that something I'd like to see? Again, I'd, I'd have to have a conversation with the ownership group about that. Okay. Um, so those are my primary highlights right now. I'll, I'll leave it for other discussion at this point. Commissioner Briggs. Well, it sounds like, um, based on how long and kind of how far this project has gotten and how, much, how many negotiations and tweaks have happened, that there's, there's at least been some entertaining, I don't know if this is fair to say, from a staff perspective about whether the R4E sort of zoning designation was appropriate. Is that, is that fair to, to suggest that? Yes. Okay. Um, so it's not, it, it, I guess it's not, from the staff's perspective, um, a completely um, crazy proposition that this was put forward. It's more been sort of a balancing of, oh. of different, you know, uh, what maybe the public benefits were. Um, to me, when I'm looking at this, I am reminded again of how disappointing it is that our um, master land use process has been delayed um, longer. I mean, it wouldn't have impacted this project regardless, but it's um, we can see how many pressures we're having on sites um, based on what our sort of new sustainability and transportation does, you know, interests are in the community versus what our sort of older land use plans recommend. And so I can understand the frustration from sort of the developer's perspective of looking at a land use recommendations from 30 years ago that don't seem to be consistent necessarily with what our more recent master planning documents suggest as well as maybe more of the development that we're, we've seen in that region. And when I look at this project, um, you know, for a heavily um, dense project outside of the downtown, it's it's actually remarkable how much is already in place to support that from a walkability um, perspective. It's it's pretty impressive. I can understand how some of the folks who live in the neighborhood nearby feel like this is a little intense, but um, so. I guess the other question is based on obviously what the land use recommendations are for the area and that that is what um, what our master plan documents suggest right now. Were there discussions um, um, at looking at this as a PUD, thinking about that? Um, this seems like one of those situations where that would have been an appropriate, though painful process to potentially go through. I'm, I'm just curious how much that was was considered or, and why it wasn't um, um well i can just speak it, it it was submitted directly as an r4e proposal mm -hmm. with the site plan so there were not discussions regarding a pud i mean internally staff we had some discussions but with the petitioner it was submitted pretty much exactly how you see it with without the you know some of the green features and things yeah and I guess just kind of throwing that back out to the development team, if you'd like to discuss that a little bit based on 
sort of the recent discussions that you've seen um, around development in our community recently um, and sort of po new policy directions? Uh, is that is that something that um, you would be interested in considering? Um, based on past discussions with the ownership group, I'd say that's very unlikely. Okay. Um, and then the other question, personally, so, uh, I guess the other question I have is transportation. So, um, Ms. Redinger, I, with the traffic report, I know that the traffic report said that there wasn't, um, despite the fact that you just described the whole boulevard situation, I'm still having a hard time processing exactly what those changes are, but I know it also didn't recommend um, changes at the intersection. But one of the challenges that I have with this development of this density where you're suggesting that folks need to just turn it's right in, right out, um, even if that's put there, it seems like the temptation would really be to do movements that are find some other movement that would get you going left a lot more quickly than you should. So would there, what, has there ever been consideration of a roundabout at the um, main Sio Church location? I mean, I know this is just throwing around, you know, but was that, is that something that's ever been entertained? I could imagine that being with a much denser development there, beneficial. I am not aware of any design considerations for a roundabout at that intersection ever have been done before. Is that, does, when I suggest something like that, I mean, I'm just curious what your reactions are to that. That's obviously just, that's coming, that thought is coming with very little engineering background in terms of thinking about whether that would be a logical recommendation at all to even consider for a location like that. Is that, I don't know if you have general thoughts about it. Well, and a roundabout in that location would have to be a multi-lane roundabout. Um, I, nothing lower than that mm -hmm. would work, I don't think. And as such, it would require a very large footprint. Mm -hmm. And right of way is a little bit constrained at that intersection. Mm -hmm. Are there other thoughts on that from a development team? Um, only, I mean, we had, we had not considered any roundabout, but um, the the movement that uh, uh, an occupant or resident who wanted to travel south or southwest, they would exit the second or the southern exit to the project and go out onto the main street, like south of the South Church or the Anna Saline Road exit. Our, our intersection. So there is a way for, for residents to make the same travel choice as trying to take a okay. kitty wampus left hand turn out of the entrance, which they couldn't make with the redesign of the island. So um, I just want to make sure you're aware that there is that opportunity for residents to leave out, out of the other entrance. Okay, okay. That, that does actually help a little bit on that. Okay, thank you for reminding me of that. That's all for me right now. Further discussion? Commissioner Hammerschmidt. Thank you. So I apologize if I missed this somewhere in the staff report. Um, the townhomes, how many bedrooms? What's the breakdown there? I, I don't think I have the breakdown of the bedrooms, uh, but, but the architect may be able to answer that. <laughs> I, I, I'm not sure how many bedrooms were in the townhomes. Uh, Bob Lampkin can probably speak to that, although it may be in the report. B Bob, can you unmute? Yeah. Um, I believe they are all two bedroom townhomes. Okay. And then um, the affordable units, is that all proposed to be in the apartment building? Or not necessarily? Or I believe so, but again, the, the, they may speak. We haven't right. assigned, while well, there's a number assigned with there, um, there wasn't specific units, but they do say studios, the yeah. majority of the affordable ones. So I, I think those would be in the apartment, but again, the architect may be able to, to answer that more specifically. 
Yeah. So the so the since the townhouses are the are all two bedroom, um, a lot of the the ones that are uh, studio or one bedroom uh, commitments for the affordable couldn't be in the townhouses, and and my guess is that the two bedroom affordables would also be in one of the larger apartment buildings rather than the townhouse. I guess in a roundabout way, <laughs> um, sort of trying to get at, I would like to see. Well, I, I think. I, along with many of my fellow commissioners, would like to see more affordable units than the nine. Um, the, oops, sorry. This is the perils of Zoom. Um, sorry. Um, but I'm just trying to think of, um, you know, people that want to live in Ann Arbor and can't afford to live in Ann Arbor and the types of housing that they might want. And many of them would probably want something more than a studio. So I would also like to see it, the mix changed a little bit, if that's at all possible. I understand that financially that might be difficult, um, but you know, more of the two bedrooms so that families could essentially move into these apartments or townhouses. I'm not sure what the profile of residents that you guys are thinking about at all. Um, that's just one thing that struck me as I was reading through this um if that's anything that you've considered and set on or if there's still some negotiation that can happen um and i th i think we got and i'm getting confused now between all the different public comments we heard and read but i think we received a communication about um pedestrian access to bushes and potentially being unsafe and if that is not does not sound familiar then I can ignore that, but can, I guess, can you talk a little bit about how, I think the point was maybe that intersection at Sio Church wasn't the safest for pedestrians? So if you can, uh, uh, Brett, if you can pull up the slide, um, uh, let me give you the number. Um, where'd my reference list go? Um, there was the slide that had the bus stops, um, slide 10, yeah. No, slide 10. Yep, right there. Oh, up, 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 up. You passed it. Keep going down. Right there, that one. So, um, it, what you're seeing there in blue is currently non existent. Um, there is no uh, pedestrian way on that side of Main Street. It, in fact, I believe City Council authorized uh, an engineering study to put a pedestrian uh, way on that side of Main Street uh, all the way down to Stadium Boulevard. Um, and what we agreed to do was put in this section uh, so that you could cross at the signalized intersection of uh, Sio Church and Main. And then um, you could also continue south and you could cross at the Ann Arbor Saline Road. Section. That's what I meant. Sorry. Yeah. yeah. The, the signalization would, of course, be adapted uh, for the pedestrian crossing, which doesn't now exist. So the signaling timing hasn't been adjusted to permit it. But obviously, when there is a pedestrian path there, they would adjust the signaling uh, to create a safe passage for the pedestrians who wanted to cross the bushes. And I think that's a huge benefit too of the location of this site is just the adjacency to a grocery store that's and all the other amenities that exist within that shopping center, as well as I assume you didn't, I don't think you mentioned this and I don't think it was in your walk shed, but there's a high school really close by that you can walk to, right? Yeah, you could cross uh, across the main street at the Sio Church uh, right there and go uh, do north to Pioneer at the corner of, the, that's the Pioneer Prairie on the other side of of, of Sio Church there, so mm -hmm. you could literally walk to school uh, if you if that's if you were you know student living there. Yeah, um, we have we have uh, generally selected these as to be market rate housing, so they would be available to anybody who wanted to live and work in mm -hmm. Ann Arbor. Um, we're hoping that some of the studio units would be appealing to those people that were working um, in the downtown area. Maybe they're working at at one of the restaurants, or uh, maybe they're a grad student. Um, so. It's not a it's not a student focused uh, project, but uh, we we assume there'll be a lots of university affiliated people um, uh, living there who work for the university or other employers in Ann Arbor. Um, so uh, I can certainly have a discussion with with my uh, clients on the mix of the the affordables, but we have some two bedrooms in the mix already. Mm -hmm. And I assume you're putting in a playground, so they would hope for at least some children to be living there as well. We anticipate there would be some. Mm -hmm. um, is any of the 
space on the set, and this is, I guess, also thinking about the the desire from staff, you know, to go a little bit further um, for some of this for this zoning and this density. Um, are any of the open spaces on the site publicly accessible? Are you imagining that you know people that live nearby could also easily come access this playground? And I think there's a slide really quickly about like parks you could walk to. So that I didn't fully absorb, but I'm just trying to think of like other public public benefit that might exist in some of the things that you're already planning for this site or if you're really envisioning well, it, to be for residents only. It's not a gated community. I mean, there's there's no, no you know, uh, guard out there preventing people from coming out of the site. Right. So. Okay. Um, and you did mention there were three parks, existing parks that were walkable from this site too. Oh, there's several, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, I mean, I guess from my perspective, and I appreciate the, the um, you know, callers and the, the communication that we got about density concerns, but, you know, this is along a transit corridor. We've been talking about density along a transit corridor. I'm not sure what other scenario would make a project like this appealing. I mean, I... I that I think there's some more discussion to be had and potentially some more changes to make, but in in general, like I think that this looks like a really great project and a good location. And I apologize for my children. <laughs> All right, further discussion? Commissioner Abrams. Hi, um, thank you. Uh, I guess I'm, I'm feeling really torn about this project, which I sense maybe some of the other commissioners are as well. I think, um, as some people have said, it in many ways meets um, criteria for projects that we would like to see in town in terms of um, increased density, some sustainability measures, some affordable housing, uh, walkability and those kinds of things. Um, and I understand that, I guess, I, I guess one of the things that I'm really not sure about, um, and it's difficult because I think I would usually ask staff to help provide me some guidance in this is the appropriateness of using a 30 year old master plan that maybe doesn't, didn't have the same value priorities that we would identify today uh, that probably will be uh, embodied in a new master plan to come in the near future or future. So, you know, like the appropriateness of using something that from that long ago in evaluating this. And so, um, and then I think that the kind of next question, just as I kind of think through it methodically is to say, well, if we, if we agree that maybe R1 is not the right density and that we don't want to be designating more land to single family homes in Ann Arbor, that's not the kind of density we're trying to foster, then the next question is what is appropriate? And there's a huge jump from R1D to R4E. So there's a, there's a big jump from, my math might be wrong, but if I'm, I think right now, if there's 15 parcels, which we assumed 15 single family homes on 10 acres, that's like a 1.5 dwelling unit per acre and the proposal is 50. And so I think one of the things, you know, I would love to hear from colleagues or staff too about how to think through the rationale for figuring out what density is appropriate. And a lot of the public comment that we got were, were citizens feeling like they support development, they support increased density, but this was too much. 79 feet was too high, right? So there's a kind of threshold that I think, um, we, there is a threshold, I guess. There's a kind of line and I'm trying, you know, as I consider how I would vote for this uh, up or down, kind of where I think that line should be. Um, and so I don't have an answer for that. I'm just kind of maybe sharing my deliberation with you and hoping maybe through dialogue we can, uh, I can get some, come to some clarity. I think I share my fellow commissioners desire for um, all 15 units to be 60% AMI. Um, so officially affordable by the city's designation. I think uh, as a percentage of the total number of units, that's still quite small. 
Uh, I support the desire for full electrification. I think that part of our desire for density and walkability are, are goals related to sustainability. Um, and as one of the callers mentioned, the city of Ann Arbor is taking, you know, concerted measures. Um, and so I think everything this building can do to kind of meet those sustainability goals makes sense uh, and should be, I think, things that we're holding uh, developers accountable to meeting. Um, yeah, so those are those are kind of my thoughts. They're not conclusive. Maybe maybe a few more minutes of conversation can help me on that. But for me, it's kind of like, in general, I support the the kind of qualities of the project, the development on that site, increased density, transit corridor, walkability, et cetera. Um, but it's 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 a kind of extreme. It, 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 the density feels at the kind of you know extreme end, and I'm I'm trying to figure out kind of where on the dial uh, the appropriate density would be. Thanks. Uh, Commissioner Woods, do you have your hand up? Um, I think there's a lot that I like about this particular project and a lot that it has going for it. Um, the master plan is really taking a hit during this meeting. And I think maybe one of the things we should we should think about is um, it, it has been around for a long time, but but even when you think about uh, looking at a master plan, it takes a lot of gearing up to do that and, uh, you know, expense and everything else. So, so I can see why they exist for, for quite a while. The other thing is, I think many times this particular project, if I'm not mistaken, is actually a combination of a number of sites, I think, based upon what either the developer said or I read within the, within the, uh, report. So, um, perhaps those who looked at the master plan back in the day weren't really thinking somebody's going to combine a lot of things, put it together, and therefore it will support a higher density and, and that sort of thing. So we should always just have a little caveat, I think, when we, when we talk about things like that. I would have liked to have seen a, um, a table, perhaps, which could give uh, the Planning Commission a better sense of the differences or the um, what you're getting with an R1D versus the uh, uh, conditional zoning and the um, uh, R4 that the that the commission that the developer has proposed. Um, yet, nevertheless, um, hardly any neighborhood ever wants more density right beside them. Um, traffic is going to be a nightmare for every all of us, no matter what we sort of put in there. We know that. And, um, you know, one of the things I'm thinking about is uh, when there's a football game, you know, there's going to be what a lot more people needing to go south, I guess, at that point. But, you know, Michigan football, give or take a couple thousand people, you know, what what's what difference does that really make, I guess. Um, but the other thing that is a stumbling block for me at this point is the affordable housing units. and. Um, if someone from the development team can uh, talk a little bit more about that, because we're getting to the point where we're, many of us are getting a little tired of hearing, oh, we talked about nine, we talked about 15, and nobody wanted, we, we're not going there. I mean, you're asking a lot from the city, so, you know, if you want the city and the residents to, uh, live with this increased density, can't we at least also get you work with us so that we can have more people who are going to be living in the city and working in the downtown area and would love to have a development like this as their home. Let's, let's see if we can't get a few more of those folks to be able to live in this area as well. So um, I, I really need to hear more about that, particularly because it is one of the city's goals, just as sustainability and walkability is important as well. So thank you for doing that. Um, but let's also, you know, this could be a good opportunity to really, to really do the affordability as well. Um, I, I'm certainly willing to have the discussion, as I indicated with the ownership group about the sh shifting or changing and perhaps even adding affordable units. Um, in light of one of the uh, uh, public hearing comments and in light of uh, uh, 
planning commissioner Ackerman's uh, discussion of what took transpired last night at uh, city council regarding carbon neutrality and sustainability. Since we have our energy expert here with us, um, perhaps you'd like to ask him some questions about the sustainability of this model of development over single family. Sure, we'll we'll get to that in a minute. I just wanted a couple couple of comments that I have um, in regards to I guess uh, Miss Redinger, if you're here, if you're available for a quick question. If not, I'll move on. Oh, yes, thank you. Um, the stub road, so sort of the stub off of South Main. It so I've been on that road, although it's been several years since I've been on that road. Um, I actually did not realize that it was a road. I thought it was a driveway. Um, is that road really equipped for the amount of traffic uh, to support 454 units and three, 731 parking uh, spots? Is that road really equipped for that much traffic since it mostly looks like a driveway? It is a low volume street. It is a public street. Uh, I'm actually going to defer to the developer's uh, transportation consultant if she wouldn't mind talking about how many trips that um, are anticipated to be on that driveway. Sure. Yeah, I'm looking at the, the volume of traffic on the driveway and with the future traffic volumes that we're looking, um, we did collect existing traffic volumes on that driveway um, and added them to the site generated traffic volume to calculate the total. So. The peak hour traffic volumes are um, right around uh, 100 um, ingress, um, a little less on the egress because we have that additional access on um, Main Street. So we split the um, egress from the two driveways and the, all the ingress will mostly have to come in via Main Street. So um, the volume of traffic is if we're looking at 200 vehicles during the peak hour that's right around maybe 2,000 vehicles a day which is a relatively low traffic volume for a side street and, and that's a traffic volume that would be consistent with a, um, a low volume street of this nature throughout the city okay now, the one thing that's a little bit different about this street from my recollection, although it's been probably two or three years since I've been down there, um, a lot of people park off of that street, um, not parallel, but they literally pull into the golf course, and I believe it's the driving range that's there, um, and then they back out right into that street there. So my concern is if there's going to be so much more traffic going uh, back and forth on that street. Um, one, I'm concerned about the quality of the street, if it's truly, you know, able to handle that much traffic. And I'm not talking about handling um, the number of cars, but I, I don't remember that being a very uh, nice road, I should say, um, something that would probably need some maintenance. Um, but also my concern is as people are parking into the driving range there of how the, they are then backing out onto um, the street. So. I'm a little concerned about that. And, and part of it, the concern goes in regards to traffic is that um, with the entrance off of Ann Arbor, or actually at that point, it's Main Street. Um, my concern lies in the regards that, you know, since it is right in and right out um, with regards to people who are going southbound, um, you know, if that's not a smooth, you know, road for people to travel on the stub road, um, and they decide they want to exit out um, through the main Main Street exit, um, and they need to go southbound. The, really, the next turnaround spot is Pioneer High School. Um, and people are driving in there. I know we have buses. It's a park and ride lot. There's a lot that's already happening there. Um, and so I'm just concerned all those cars then going into, uh, into Pioneer High School, along with you know kids driving to school. Um, that that might not be a, um, that's, I don't, yeah, I'm, I'm really concerned about that. Um, I was actually really surprised with the access for 454 units, um, that that's all that we provided with access to the site. Um, uh, one main entrance and another one that sort of is kind of a 
entrance and exit out of the site. Um, so I'm not, I've, I look through the traffic study, I, I'm not 100% comfortable with um, the traffic flow that's going to happen there. Um, so I, I, I want to learn more about that um, before moving forward on this. Um, with regards to affordable housing, I agree with all my colleagues. Um, you know, I'm out of 454 units to have only 15 affordable units. I'm not telling the developer what to do here, but um, maybe we need more than 15 units here. Um, full electrification, um, I'm in full support of that. Obviously with what's transpired at city council last night, I think we need to start going in that direction. Um, I agree with Commissioner Briggs, a PUD uh, might not be a bad idea for the site. Uh, for what it is. Unfortunately, the master plan, I'm not going to say the master plan is uh, failing us in this regard because I do believe that uh, density is important um, for this. Um, but um, I, I think there's more, yeah, I'm not going to dog the master plan. The master, we already know what's going on with the master plan. It needs to be rewritten. So I'm all for density. I will say knowing the site and then looking at the uh, dry or the, the situation with the traffic in and out of the site, 454 units seems like a lot of people moving in and out, 731 parking spots. That's a lot of cars going in and out. And I'm not um, totally comfortable with that. Um, and I agree with Commissioner Abrams, you know, there's that line and I think 454 units has crossed over that line where I don't feel comfortable uh, with that number. Um, I don't know what it's going to take me to get more comfortable with it, uh, but I'm, I think 450, 454, based on the current master plan that we have in place, um, is uh, too much. It's too much. So those are my comments. Uh, Commissioner Ackerman. Mr. Leonard, did you want to offer something? Um, if I could just briefly, uh, a couple questions have come up um, by Commissioner Abrams and Commissioner Milstein um, as it relates to another number. And I think this was posed to uh, Matt uh, Kowalski as well. Um, absent a um, unpacking this site and going through sort of an updated master plan effort for that, that's why it's really difficult for us to tell you in any way what the number should be. But I just wanted to comment that generally, um, that I, I, I think that the way you are talking about this site is appropriate. Um, if, if you are looking at that single family residential density as perhaps in a questioning way, I think the ways that you would want to proceed from that are referencing the other aspects and policies of our master plan. What is this, what buttons of that policy document is this hitting from a, a connection to transportation, public transportation, to walkability, to proximity to businesses, and, um, and to um, sustainability efforts and the like. Um, because, but that I, I recognize that puts the commission uh, to start down that road in a, um, I don't want to say challenging, but it, it is, um, arriving at, in your own eyes as a commission, what that balance is. Um, so I just, wanted, I just wanted to be clear that if, if, if you feel that it's appropriate to go away from that future land use plan, the way that you're talking about the positive aspects of this proposal, I think are really valid. And those would be important to articulate as to why to, just, why to justify that. Alternatively, um, the petitioner may not be interested in exploring other, um, other densities beyond this. Um, if that's the case, that's also equally, uh, they also have the equal opportunity for you to render a decision on the proposal in front of you. So I would, at some point, um, if that's a direction the Planning Commission goes in, I would encourage you to give them the opportunity to see if that's something that they're even interested in pursuing. Thank you. Um, I guess uh, as a comment, I, when I'm hearing conversation about density, you know, I hear a couple things. One is a general discomfort with how much 
the city may be giving up and how much we're getting back. Um, I think then too, I heard from um, from the chair, Commissioner Milstein, um, some concern about the tra traffic volume, just the sheer number of cars and trips that this may produce. And then from the resident, we heard about the aesthetic of the density. Um, and, and that uh, I think gets more to massing than it does the number of units. So what is the physical footprint and how is it visible from the neighbors? And I think it is somewhat telling that the neighbors here are the neighbors directly to the south who are likely the ones going to be most affected. And I think it's important to, to listen to that voice. And so, you know, as I was measuring the distance from the neighbors to the south's property, to the property line, and then to the first building on the, the proposed development, it's about 460 feet. So, you know, it's about a football field and a half, or it's, um, you know, it's, it's about the length of a, a city block um, if you're walking downtown. Um, that's a considerable distance, but I, and, and I do respect that the developer put a lot of townhouses in the Southwest. I think that really helps to scale the density and step the density in an increasing way as you move forward or step the massing up as you move to the north. There is one building, um, building B and it's subsection B3 that's in the southeast corner. That's still a five-story building. And I think if I were the neighbors to the south and I was concerned about the density and its aesthetic impact in my life, um, you know, that's probably the building I'm concerned with. If I'm waking up and looking at a townhouse and it's a well architected and I think it's a, an attractive townhouse, I'm less concerned than I am looking at that five story building. Um, and if, if there's opportunity to meet multiple goals, so decreasing the overall density, which decreases the number of car vehicle trips, while also improving the view shed of the neighbors to the south, I think there could be a big win there. Um, so if there's opportunity to address that, that building B, B3, I think it would hit on a lot of notes that we've heard through the conversation. Um, so I guess that's, that's the last piece, because I, yeah, that, that's, that's just a, a constructive offer I wanted to, to throw out there as we also discuss the 15 units getting to them to 60% and the electrification. Um, and also, I think you heard multiple hesitations about the traffic pattern. Um, and I think if I think it would be advantageous to the developer to um, maybe do some renderings or some drawings, some engineering drawings of what those may look like, um, just to help us in our analysis. Um, I don't want to put that on the city. I don't think that's our burden. Um, but it may be uh, advantageous to your petition to help us visualize this. Uh, Commissioner Briggs and then Commissioner Gibrandel. So um, a couple of questions, one for staff in terms of um, how you might see your recommendations shifting depending on how this changes might come back. Um, and then a little bit more on sustainability. I know there was kind of mentioned, um, Mr. Moore was mentioning, you know, somebody on the team might speak to that. But I, so for the first question, um, it gives me pause if there's a fair amount of concern both from sort of residents um, and then also we're seeing a recommendation from the staff that's saying this doesn't really feel appropriate. Um, obviously, um, from our other master planning objectives, there's, there's clearly a lot in this project to like and I have many less concerns around transportation because I think this is well situated to be able to take advantage of transit and bicycling and walking and um, I, I think it's the exact sort of project that people would get on the bus rather than driving downtown. Um, so, but is there, uh, Mr. Kowalski, is there, um, could you imagine um, this project coming back with, with some changes based on kind of the discussions that you've heard around the table and that's substantially shifting the recommendation from staff saying we could, we could, R4E sounds, it does seem like the appropriate zoning designation for this. Um, well, I think, yes. I mean, as we've kind of tried to lay out in some of the staff report, I mean, I think we've talked about the master plan and we've talked about the other areas of master plan. I mean, as, as we can see, staff acknowledges conditions have changed in that area. Um, in one of our goals or, or 
something that, that reaches across a lot of our goals for our master plans, is, you know, increased density, as we've said, along transit routes and things like that. Um, however, there are many, those many other goals of that. The master plan, land use is just one element of the master plan. So, yes, I mean, I, I could see a point, again, it, is, it was staff's opinion, as you know, that, that in our, it went too far in, in one direction without satisfying other goals of master plans. So, of other elements of the master plan, I should say. So, I mean, in a long-winded way, yes. I mean, we're always open to looking at what they, what they come back with, if there's revisions in response to planning commission comments, um, anything else, uh, uh, absolutely. I mean, staff can take and revise plans. And you, I mean, again, if it comes closer and, and all things way out equal, I could imagine maybe there could be a, a change in recommendation. But I, I mean, I don't wanna say that again at this point because there's so many unknowns. But we do look, we'll look at that data or whatever is submitted as revisions and absolutely weigh it against the same criteria we've weighed it the first time. Thanks. And then when it comes to sustainability, um, I think increasingly we're going to need to move away from, as our community, I mean, I'm a, uh, I, I appreciate the table that's in the sort of, uh, in, later in the report talking about, you know, the, summarizing the city's goals with single family use versus multifamily use and how this, uh, benefits are, um, is better from a sustainability perspective. I don't think, you know, I don't think anybody around this screen um, would disagree with that. Um, but we need to be doing, obviously multifamily is better from a sustainability perspective than single family homes. Um, and having that along a denser development along a transit corridor is great, but we have to be pushing ourselves further as a community now. We recognize that. We have a really ambitious climate neutrality goal. We need to see our buildings, um, especially buildings that are gonna house so many people for the future, um, be greener. And so I think that if this project came back, it would, you know, for me, I, I would wanna see that, that manifested along the discussions. But I don't know, are there additional pieces, and the fact that it's 12% um, renewable energy is, is great, but is there, is there more that the um, sustain sustainability member of the team wanted to, to chat about and, and share with us? Hi, this is Eric Doyle. Uh, yeah, I can I can address that from a couple different perspectives. The single family versus multifamily energy use just in general. Multifamily projects use generally more than 50% less energy. So that gets into a carbon neutrality issue it gets into an affordability issue too, because on average, those families are spending roughly $1,000 less per year on energy uh, utility bills in, in a multifamily type project like this, especially ones that are more dense. Uh, when you get into greater density like this, the efficiency of the units gets better because you have less of those units have uh, outdoor um, or exterior walls, which provide uh, I guess the opposite of what you're looking for with efficiency. As far as the location is concerned, the location efficiency that we looked into with this project, if you combine a high efficiency building with great access to transit, with great access to walkability to all of the various resources around there, you can increase that additional savings of energy consumption and cost of energy by up to 70%. So those are both great cases of why you would want to look at something of a larger scale like this to address affordability, to address cost of utilities, to address the whole carbon neutrality goals that, uh, that were approved last evening, or actually, I guess this morning. Okay. Thanks. Um, and this is just one last teeny comment i really appreciated actually the, the the report that kind of helped us look at whether or not how this met our master planning goals just uh there was only one little paragraph that rubbed me a little wrong and i just thought i would mention it just for future reports i'm sorry i'm scrolling through to, to see it um it well, i can't find it. it there's the piece that talks about why it's not appropriate for single family homes um and because it's not really neighborhood like um and we're talking about creating a neighborhood for way more many people than would be there if there were single family homes there so i think if it's appropriate for multifamily housing then it's a neighborhood i i understood some of the other points in there it was just 
just a little tidbit of that rubbing me slightly the wrong way. Anyway, I'll pass this on. Commissioner Gibrandon. Um, so you don't have to convince me that um, single family is a whole lot less sustainable here. The thing that I would like to know is um, Mr. Doyle, what you feel like is possible here, because my sense is that it's not going as far as you could go. That's my gut. When I look at the plan and I look at the flyover that shows where the solar panels are, and I feel like I could live, I, I share the same discomfort that Commissioner Abrams is talking about, trying to find this sweet spot. If you guys upped your game, and really, it wasn't like kicking and screaming getting there, but leading there by what it could be, that is an entirely different thing to me. It really is. And so if you guys could max this thing out and really put solar everywhere and really make a commitment to matching what our goals are, then that feels really different to me. I feel like this site is situated in a really unique spot for a lot of the goals that we do have. It's also, uniquely cited and that it is surrounded on three sides by green space. We don't have neighbors that are, you know, 30 feet away from this thing that are going to be looking into the windows of this. This is really different in that way. So we have kind of an opportunity for density here that is a little bit different than other places in the city, I feel like. Now, granted, it's a driving range. We can't put a bunch of evergreen trees in the middle of the driving range to be able to screen it, but it's still hundreds of feet away. That's really different than many of our other situations that we have with this. I just feel like you guys are holding back on the sustainability thing. And for me, if you pushed it, you might convince me to be able to go up as high as you are. But I don't see it. I feel you hesitating. I feel you not wanting to go there. And instead, if you were saying, you know what, you're asking us to, you know, we're asking for this density, we're going to give you something really amazing with sustainability. I don't. I don't feel it from you. And with the solar thing, I was confused by the report with the solar thing. It only talked about three buildings. So you could explain that to me in terms of, you know, how you would see that. But I would just be curious what Mr. Doyle would say about what he feels like is possible in terms of solar on this project. Viability wise, in terms of the space, the loading, that kind of thing, not whether the owner is willing to pay for it, but what is possible in terms of the spatial requirements, what, you know, what, what the physical um, capability is of this project. And I'm sure you can't like just off the cuff say, okay, then that's gonna, if we could do this, then we could provide 20%. I know you can't just suddenly, you know, come up with that. But I'm just curious, cause I know you work on other projects where you do this. And I'm just curious what you feel like is possible on a project like this. Actually, I do have some statistics. We've done a white box energy model of all of the, the buildings thus far as, as designed and as proposed. And the current solar array that we're seeing on this can provide approximately 20% of the project's total electric use on, on, as, as currently designed. And so if we look at other things like electrification, which we are doing in other projects and you can do it very affordably, that tied in with energy efficiency, can increase while maintaining that same solar panel array can increase the percentage of what that provides to the project. I, I totally get what you're saying. I'm just wondering if you could fit more solar panels on those roofs. I'm sure that there are ways to do that, yes. That's what I'd be curious about. And I'm a believer in green roofs, but right now I feel like we need more solar on that roof, not more green on that roof. So that's what it would take for me is to give you that density because it is out of place. All the other things around it are, you know, two, three stories, you know, that kind of thing, but it's on like a big old street. There's, an, except for that one little piece of single family that's, that's close by, it's mostly multifamily and, it, it, and it's a big road. So I am, I feel like the R1D is less than what I think it should be. That's me personally, in terms of my own kind of, you know, threshold. Um, I respect that staff is trying to balance all these things and, and they're trying to kind of take the, you know, look at all the pieces together. I'm just telling you where I'm coming from in terms of that balancing act and how all those components come together for me. I feel like it could take more density than the, than the R1D. I could totally see this thing as, you know, four-story buildings too. But 
I, I don't want to, I'm, if, if you're going to get the height, then I would want to see something way more intense in terms of your commitment to other things, whether it's the um, carbon neutrality goals or affordability. At some point, we can't ask for everything, though, Planning Commission, <laughs> in terms of, you know, the, the, the petitioner, too. We have to kind of choose because they have, the math has to work to be able to build the thing. So we also have to kind of realize within our own sphere that things just won't happen if we ask for, you know, half of it to be affordable housing and all of it to, you know, to be super sustainable because that all costs money, too. That's the, you know, that's the reality. But for me, I would like to, um, if I'm going to um, give that, you know, allow that, feel okay about that density happening there, then I want to see um, more of a commitment and, frankly, leadership from the development team. Commissioner Survey. So I'll just say, like, at this point, I'm, I'm more supportive than not of this project. I think for a lot of the reasons about... I think density and, and multifamily makes a lot more sense than single family here. Conditions like the underground parking, when we look at the proportions of building to uh, impervious pavement to green space, I think it's, it's a, it's a well-proportioned project in that. Uh, I think uh, to Commissioner Kip Randall's point, we're talking about even carports and things. So I'd like to even see the spacing of the surface parking to be prepared that they could receive carports um, to have solar panning on panels on those as well right so if that's adopted that that spacing is already planned that that could be added to it so i think there's like a lot of things that even not in the you know again at, like what what should we ask for that we're not going all the way to pud and this reminds me of the pud conversation over on uh, jackson road that came to impervious pavement and kind of uh, environmental management and traffic and things like that. So, um, like, I don't think, I, I think this could get there without a PUD. I think the, you know, uh, the too many asks we get to a PUD, we're probably just not going to see any units. Uh, I think that we're talking about mass more than units, at least in my perspective. Um, I'm not concerned too much about the traffic and the going to uh, Pioneer the the route to go south on that leg is so much shorter and quicker than trying to go up turn around and get left and whatever that strategy is so i think people are going to come out that way and it's a pretty easy way for that traffic pattern i'm not too concerned about traffic um so i i think it really is understanding the big trade-offs that could get it get this project to happen to get a lot more units on site or in the city, which I think we desperately need, um, especially, right, R4E was adopted after the land use plan of 1990. So these two things don't overlap in any circumstance. So it is really up to us and our contextual knowledge of where we've come in the last 30 years to decide where this overlay would be appropriate. And I think we're getting there and we just have to figure out what other additional trade-offs there are. And so, um, yeah, it's dense, but we do like we almost have built in extended setbacks because of the, the perimeter land around it. Um, and so that additional height is kind of buffered by um, the directly adjacent parcels. So I think for me, I'm I'm actually kind of in the I support, but probably postponement so that the petitioner can go back look at affordable unit numbers, because so I'd like to see those raised. I'd like to look at, you know, see what uh, sustainability uh, issue can be remediated. Uh, you know, some additional review of the traffic if commissioners uh, are requesting it as well, and that we we review it again. I think that's where I'm at. Like, I'm, I'm generally in favor, but there's details to work out. Commissioner Abrams and then Commissioner Woods. Thank you. Um, I have one, I guess one question for the petitioner and one for staff. So maybe a clarification from staff um, that the conditions which are attached to the rezoning are those specific to this project? Yes. So, yes, those are specific. Okay. Okay. Offered by the petitioner specific to this project. But if we, if this body voted to approve a rezoning and then this project didn't oh. get built, 
do those conditions stand for a different yes owner yes yeah, sorry i okay. i misspoke the first so yes the zoning district is across all of the parcels that's correct well Yes, the zoning district would be assigned to all those parcels once. So if, if it were not approved, or I'm sorry, if it was approved with the R4D with conditions, the project never gets built, you would have a, a site remaining R4D with those conditions. With those conditions, okay. Correct, if that's approved by city council, that would be the zoning until otherwise changed, whether this developer or anybody else. Okay, it is. I guess I need to think about that for a moment, but, um, and then is there, um, this is a two-step vote, right? So one, one thing we're being asked to vote on is the rezoning itself, regardless of the site plan, and then the site plan, or those two things are, well, are linked? There's three steps, so there's annexation, as well as the zoning, and, the, and sorry, the conditional zoning, and the site plan. So yes, it's kind of like a, a three-stage mm -hmm. process. But there is a, there could be a scenario where we would say approve the annexation and rezoning to R4E, but not approve this site plan, for example. R4E, uh, zoning other than an R1 or an R2, but I believe R1 would require an area plan to go with it or a site plan. Yeah. Um, unless waived by the planning and development services manager, but it, um, I don't think that would happen here. But um, so yet yeah, we would need. I'd have to think through that answer more, but the to in order to zone something, the code requires an area plan or a site plan I see. For, a multi, for a multifamily zoning. I yeah, see. our ordinance does require with a rezoning it be accompanied by either a site plan or an area plan. There are exceptions for single family zoning um, where that can be waived. Um, it it would be for consideration of this conditional zoning to move forward without a site plan. Would not be meeting that expectation so ultimately um, we would um, a site plan would still have to accompany that action um, to be clear the proposed site plan is consistent with the conditional zoning mm -hmm. that is being requested okay. Um, but okay I, th I think i understand that and then a question just for the petitioner about the parking um i'm noticing that there are many more parking spots on the included with the project than are required. And I wondered if you could share a little bit of that thinking because it seems to counter this argument that you and we are making about how great it is because it's on a transit corridor and there's walkability in it. But it seems like you, are, you have an expectation actually for more than one and a half spots per unit being necessary. Yeah, that, that, that boils down to one of the the real world uh, consideration that Commissioner Gibbs Randall was speaking about uh, when she talked about you got to make the numbers work. And in this case, it's not the construction numbers, it's the financing numbers because the, the mortgage writing, underwriting entities that look to finance these projects at the back end have uh, requirements in terms of looking at, you know, parking uh, availability is one of the criteria for the underwriting. So it's it's more based on underwriting requirements. It, it is, you can view all that additional parking uh, that you're speaking about is all under the buildings. It's not, it's not taking off a surface area. It's, it's another level of underground parking. It, it's our expense to build, but it, it makes the building uh, financeable. Right, so I, that's interesting. Thank you for educating me about that. Um, no, I'm aware that it's that it's money that you that, that the owner will spend that could be put to other things like some more affordable units or something. So I'm kind of I'm wondering about that. But um, thank you for for uh, educating me. That's interesting to know. Thanks. Yeah, the reality is um, all the grandest plans of architects and landscape architects and energy consultants and traffic engineers are for not if you can't get it financed. Oh, I'm I'm well aware. Thanks. Commissioner Woods. So I'd like to move for a postponement um, and um, uh, for all the reasons that other commissioners have said. And I don't know if um, Mr. Leonard, you need a listing or, I, um, or if Mr. Moore needs to know exactly why many of us are saying better to postpone it uh, at this point. Um, because if we were to take a vote, I don't think I would be voting for it for um, 
for a number of the reasons that have been listed, my own as well as other commissioners. So um, I move to postpone. Do I have a second? Uh, seconded by Commissioner Sauvet. Um, any discussion on the postponement? Mr. Leonard. Um, I would just like to make, I would like to check in to make sure that um, Mr. Kowalski and I understand the follow-up items that you would like addressed. Uh, so my notes are the possibility to for, provide additional sustainability elements to the site, be it additional renewable energy, other ways to make to lead with sustain, sustainability efforts. Um, one of those is to consider complete electrification of the development. Whether or not there is a possibility to extend the number of 60% area median income units to either a minimum of the full 15 or beyond. The consideration of the southeast corner building potentially um, reducing the scale of that to the proximate uh, land uses and potentially uh, and some renderings of how the configuration might take place. Um, is there anything that I was missing in that just to make sure that we understand what you're looking for? I just want to make sure that the looking at like further solar capacity would be within your list of sustainability items, not just full electrification. Commissioner Briggs. I think that's our wish list. Um, if for some reason that um, if the team goes back and finds that that is those those items on the wish list are not feasible for a different variety of different reasons, obviously. Um, what we're hearing from staff and from and from nearby residents is that less density is is desirable. And so, if for some reason, you know, kind of meeting our our dreams <laughs> is not possible. Um, it seems like the only other path under this would be would be less density. So that's not my personal preference. Further discuss, uh, Commissioner Hammersmith. And then on the affordability, I'd just like to see if there's a way to mix up the mix, like what is the best mix possible? You know, I'd, I'd almost rather have nine affordable, but a different mix than like 15 studio affordable, maybe. But anyway, just some different scenarios that they might be able to come up with. Further discussion on the postponement? Seeing none, all those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Uh, opposed? Aye. All right, this item is postponed. Um, all right, who, who opposed? No, none. No, no one? Okay, all right, all right. All right, thank you very much. Um, and we will take a five minute recess. Um, so we will be back in just a couple of minutes. Thank you. Thanks so much.
we know you're back. Business is Liberty Townhome Site Plan for City Council approval. Uh, we'll begin the meeting with a uh, petitioner presentation. Um, they'll have 10 minutes to present uh, their project before us, followed by a staff report for Ms. Delio, um, then a public hearing, and then we will um, have a motion and discussion. Um, so I will let the petitioner group um, get started. Alexis, are you going to run a presentation? Or am I? Yes, I have the um, uh, I have the slides. I can share. Anyone can share them, but I have their presentation that I can share right now. Okay, is this working? Yep. Okay. All right, the team. You can proceed with your. Uh, uh, introduction to your project. Sorry, had a little new problem there. Alexis, you can leave that slide up for now and I'll tell you if, uh, if I needed to change it. Uh, I'm John Curry from PEA. We're the project engineer. Uh, Julie Kroll, uh, Bill Jarrett, Tom Gritter are also on the, on the Zoom today. Uh, we're excited to finally be here with this project. It's been a long time in the works. Uh, this long vacant site was previously approved for a higher density development four years ago. And over the last several years, we've worked with the owner and the city to further revise the, revise the plan and arrive at a less dense project with 52 market rate townhome apartments rather than the original 68 units proposed. Uh, Liberty Townhomes was designed to meet the requirements of the four, R4B district uh, by right. No variances or modifications are requested for the development, and it serves a need to provide housing for Ann Arbor's workforce. The buildings proposed are a modern townhome style with garages on the ground floor, access from a vehicular courtyard between the buildings. Uh, Alexis, you can switch to the second slide now. There we go. Uh, there's a vehicular courtyard between the buildings on one side with access to the garage. <laughs> Uh, Walk-up entrances and pedestrian courtyards are on the opposite side of the building. Uh, the units are a mix of two and three bedroom units um, and provide approximately 1,400 square feet of living space. Uh, as part of this project, there is a sidewalk gap across two properties east of us on the way to Maple. I uh, will be filling in that sidewalk gap to allow residents to walk to stores and restaurants on Maple and Liberty. Uh, the developer is also making a contribution to the city park fund as another community benefit. Uh, utilizing retaining walls, we're preserving a large stand of mature spruce trees along 94, as well as a tree row on the east property line that includes several landmark trees. And of course, we're providing all required landscape plantings and screening as well. Uh, the stormwater detention basin has been approved by the Water Resources Commissioner, and we've also provided a walking path loop and the open space around the basin. The site will connect to public water mains in Liberty and to a site uh, to the rear of our site creating a loop between Maple and Liberty with the water main. I will be connecting to public sanitary and Liberty and also providing a stub for future development to the east of us. Uh, through multiple iterations and responding to all the department's concerns, there remained one issue with the site entrance that the fire department and traffic engineer were not fully comfortable with. Uh, however, over the last couple of weeks, uh, even yesterday and into this afternoon, we've been working through a design solution for that with the city. 
that we think will address those concerns, uh, meet all code requirements, and put the land to its highest and best use. Uh, I'd like to turn this over to Bill Jarrett, the architect, to discuss the building. Um, after that, we can open it up for discussion and any questions you might have. Bill? Is Bill, can you hear me? Hello? Uh, if Bill can't connect, yeah, I can, can go you? over. Yeah, I got you now, Bill. Am I connected? Yes, you are. Okay. Uh, yeah, just real quick. Um, as John mentioned, the units are townhome units. So we have the, and they're roughly 1,400, 1,500 square feet thereabouts, depending on whether you add the mud room in and so forth on the lower level. But just to run through the basic layout. Um, oh, yeah, by the way, I'm Bill Jarrett, Jarrett Architecture. And uh, thank you for having us here today. Um, so the lower level, if you look at the garage level there, um, includes uh, the tandem two parking spot and a uh, mud room vestibule area that it brings you into a stairway that takes you up to the second floor, which is the main level with living, kitchen, dining, bathroom, and a nice balcony up there. And then uh, from there, you go up to a third floor, two bedrooms, two bath, nice roomy bedrooms. Um, very efficient plan, uh, getting a lot of space in here and a lot of views at a, at a very in a very small footprint. And then uh, from the bedroom level, we can go up to a fourth level where we have we have a small study up there, which would be uh, would also include like a rooftop uh, garden type area to uh, hang out on. And the, the overall look, we're really just trying to come up with a real modern look here. The combination of brick, stone, aluminum storefront systems. So we have a lot of glass and a lot of that glass is facing south. So we can take advantage of some uh, passive solar there. And then uh, we have uh, a metal panel is kind of in the center area of the elevation. If you want to switch to the elevations there, we can, we can kind of run through that. And now, which would be the next slide there. Yeah. Um, so that center area on the front elevation would be, uh, we're looking at either a Luca bond, which is an aluminum panel system or possibly a limestone product to kind of break up the massing there. So it's not just like a continuous row of townhomes. Um, and then on the very top where we do have the loft area, we're looking at putting some corrugated steel in there or another type of more modern looking metal. Um, the garage doors are somewhat recessed a little bit of, to a lower level, so they're not going to be real visible, which is a nice feature. Um, the overall height is about 35 feet on the garage side and 30 feet from the front side. So it's not really an overly intrusive height on the, with this particular building. Um, as far as uh, sustainability, the, as you can see, the units are very uh, rectangular in nature and they're lined up nicely. And that makes for a very efficient plan as far as energy goes. Um, and we would, uh, we can certainly get, you know, a fair amount of insulation on the roof. And then the outside walls, plus the clusters are five, six, and seven units, but the outside walls will add additional insulation in there as well. Um, and like I said, we might, we, I think we're gonna be able to pick up a certain amount of solar from the south facing windows. Um, and uh, I think we just think it's a, we just think it's a very attractive concept and works well for the uh, Ann Arbor market. And with that, I'll I'm up for any questions and back to John, I suppose. Yeah, we're prepared to take any uh, questions or discussion from the commissioners. Great, thank you very much. Um, so I'd like to head over to Ms. Delio for a staff report. Um, thank you, Planning Commission. Um, I'll just go over our staff report, the contents and our staff re uh, review. Um, briefly, it's a, a 52 unit townhome project on a 4.6 acre site zoned R4B. Um, 
uh, staff has gone over the site plan um, and we have found that it meets all development standards with one exception. Um, there are, um, in terms of statistics, it is an 11 dwelling unit per acre project. The R4B allows up to 15 dwelling units. It meets the requirements for open space, proposing 56% open space. 55% is the minimum required. Front setback on Liberty is 15 feet. Um, parking, required parking is 78 spaces. They are providing 104. There are seven landmark trees on the site. Um, uh, there are seven landmark trees on the site. Two are proposed to be removed and will be mitigated. The, um, uh, as Mr. Curry mentioned, their public sidewalk will be extended in front of the site for a short bit just from the driveway eastward. It will not go behind westward behind the guardrail. Um, and it will continue across a couple properties to meet up with the stub provided by the West Town, um, originally called Blue Heron. Or do I have that backwards? Originally West Town, now Blue Heron. Um, and they are proposing to do a parkland contribution for, um, as, requ as uh, requested. Um, staff originally recommended denial because the project did not meet the fire code standard for emergency vehicle egress. Um, but as Mr. Curry mentioned, and as the um, secondary cover letter mentioned, Things have happened since Friday, the, um, since the planning, I'm sorry, since the staff report was published. It appears that with some more revisions that they have found a way to make the, um, uh, the island will be able to comply with the fire code. It still will not, the driveway location still will not comply with site distance to the west. So for making a right turn, uh, making a left turn out of the site. Therefore, the turn movement will be restricted. Um, and that is a permissible um, operation um, to address lack of site distance. Um, I would mention as a side, we do have Cynthia Redinger, transportation um, engineer, um, part of this call. And because that right there is the limit of my transportation knowledge. Um, so if the detail checks out, um, so far staff does look at the detail um, sketch and it's looking promising, but we do need to do a full review of it. And if it checks out, then we'll get it incorporated into the full site plan and um, we will come back to the planning commission. So we are switching our recommendation from denial to postpone. Um, I am uh, happy to answer any additional questions. My notes say I did wanna mention that the site was annexed in 2005 and zoned R4B in 2007. We've had uh, site plans come through in fits and starts, but um, there has been no approved entitlement on the property as of yet. Now, I'm free to answer any additional questions. And like I mentioned, we also have a traffic engineer if need be. Thank you very much. Um, at this time, to open up the public hearing. This is an opportunity for persons to speak for up to three minutes about the proposed rezoning and site plan for Liberty Townhomes at 2658 West Liberty. Public comment may be made by calling 1-877-853-5247 and then entering meeting ID 926-3370-3308. This information is also displayed on the meeting agenda and video feed. City staff will select the callers that have raised their hand one by one using the last three digits of your phone number. In order to electronically raise your hand after dialing into the meeting, please press not star nine on your phone. You'll hear an automated announcement once the host is allowing you to speak. When speaking, please move to a quiet area and mute any television or background sounds so that we may hear you clearly. Please state your name and address at the beginning of your comments. Please raise your hand to speak or press star nine on your phone. No speakers indicated. Seeing no one, I'll close the public hearing and I will read the motion. 
The Ann Arbor City Planning Commission hereby recommends that the Mayor and City Council approve the Liberty Townhome Site Plan. Do you have a commissioner that will move? Moved by Commissioner Woods, seconded by Commissioner Ackerman. Uh, we are in discussion. Commissioner Ackerman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, just, I guess I want to defer to the body, but is there since we want to discuss this or, or postpone that? So I'll just raise that question um, and, and see what others think. Happy either way. But. I think it would be good for us to discuss it just so that uh, we can give the petitioner feedback so that when they do return, there are no surprises at that time. Um, so I would like to have a uh, discussion on it. Um, I did have one quick question um, for staff, and that is, I swear in the last couple of years we approved, it came before us and we approved a project on this site. And I don't know if it went on to city council, but I, but I, it was, possibly a McKinley project. Um, and I know we, we, we approved something. I, I feel like we've, we've, we've dealt with the site before. Um, yes. Um, in 2016, I double checked the date. Um, in 2016, uh, it was called Liberty Flats and the planning commission, um, and it was very, very similar. And it was a um, McKinley um, uh, would would have been the owner, um, and it came through, and it was recommended for approval by the planning commission, and it was scheduled for a city council meeting. And about noon of the day of the city council meeting, the applicant asked for it to be postponed. And so, and it was the city council did postpone it as requested. And uh, a few uh, some weeks months went by, and they ultimately asked it to be um, just withdrawn. So just from a city council, I'm sorry, just from a planning commission perspective, it was recommended for approval and it appeared it would have been approved. Okay, thank you. Um, all right, further discussion. Commissioner Briggs. Um, can we talk a little bit more about the transportation issues? It sounds like the one with the fire issue has been resolved, but um, uh, in terms of the sort of restrictions on turning movements, that always seems problematic. Um, I don't know if Ms. Fredinger could discuss those a little bit in terms of how concerned she is with those, those issues. Sure. So as uh, Lexis read in the staff report, the driveway cannot support decision site distance for a motorist who is exiting the site who would be turning left. And those restrictions are, the limitation to that site distance is really a function of where the driveway is in relation to where the bridge over I-94 is. The bridge over an I-94 is both on a horizontal or a horizontal and a, and a vertical curve. So the combination of those, those two geometric elements with you know, the bridge items such as the parapet wall and the guardrail and where the drive approach meets liberty, it really restricts your sight distance as you would be looking to the to your right as a driver to make that left. And um, there's an area for decision sight distance where you're supposed to be free of obstruction and the parapet wall and guardrail are in that area. It doesn't block entirely, but it blocks the majority of the site area. So that's why the applicant has proposed that right turnout only to overcome that site limitation. So this would be regardless of how that property was used, it would always really be an issue with having a driveway there with pretty much any, whether it was residential or not, I guess is what I'm asking. 
Yes. Um, if it were a single family home, as it previously was, there would be less concern about that in an area like that. You, you really usually expect to be able to provide stopping site distance for motorists on main line, although it's always good to be able to provide decision site distance if possible. But when you're, when you're looking at um, larger developments such as this, we're, we always look to make sure that we can provide that that decision site distance. So the the applicants team has put together the suggestion of um, this alternative of the right out only that would then um, move all trips would have to go right and in order to return to the city they either um, will have a bit of a detour um, out to Wagner Road or they would be required to you know, duck into a residential street to turn around. And are there any sort of changes that could happen? I mean, is are there any modifications to the roadway or bridge that are feasible to do that would, would correct for those, those site distance issues? It would be very costly the it you know the the grade of the site and the grade of liberty street itself relative to the bridge um they're a good bit lower the the bridge is is higher than the surrounding land so that you know you have the guardrail there because you have the slope up to the street as it's it's, it's going over the bridge so it would be very costly to overcome that are there it feels like Seems like I used to see this and I don't see this anymore. Are mirrors ever used to help drivers to be able to see situations? I'm just very skeptical of anybody actually following just turn right. I'm just wondering if there are, if this was approved, people are, despite the signs that are put up, um, we tend to, to do what we want to do. Are there things that could be put in put into place that would make that safer? That's a great question. And this we've gone through a couple of design rounds with the applicant. And I think John is raising his hand and asking to be able to, <laughs> to respond to that a little bit. But we have, um, they have proposed some design solutions to that. And I will let John go ahead and, and discuss that if everyone has agreed. Sure. Um, I probably I'm going to say the same thing you would have, but the look at the geometry of that driveway, the intent is to really kind of force people to take that right turn. Um, you can't control everyone from doing anything, uh, but the idea with that curved island with a channelized right turn would make it really uncomfortable to try to turn left there. That's kind of the idea of that. They call it a pork chop, a right out um, island. So that it, to answer your question, that that's the method by which we try to control those right turns physically, not just with signage. Okay. Um, that's, that was my, my major question. The other piece, and I, just a thought, it looks, obviously this, this project is gonna get designed however, um, seems best but it seems like there's stairs into the the residences and stairs like once you're in the garage there's stairs up is that is that correct like there's no level entry anywhere to any of those townhouses is that right i don't know who on the development yeah, yeah that is correct oh. i don't know if bill wants to address that at all but that it's generally the I, you you know. know, the question was if the is there entrances into like a living space there you mean or is that yeah right? just everything <laughs> entry every, all the entries into the homes are by stairs right yes okay and yeah, sure we would have some stairs coming from the entrances there down to the sidewalk on the front um let's see uh yeah everything would be by stairs and i can understand that from you know how trying to make efficient use of space and different things but from an accessibility standpoint you know not just not just thinking wheelchairs but you know thinking aging parents and grandparents and somebody breaks a leg I don't know. just 
just a random thought about that being uh, problematic for many people um, having anybody visit them. So, you know, I understand it's, you know, they're not catering, they're not residences catering to folks who are accessible, but, you know, there's just so many folks who, who have those needs at some point or have somebody that they love who has a need to come into their home. So um, it seems like they would open up your market a little bit to, or at least um, reduce frustrations down the line to, to have some entry point. But that was just a general thought. Thank you. The most of my questions were on transportation. Further discussion? Commissioner Sove? Yeah, I guess with transportation, you know, looking at Street View, even with the right turn, I put the wide opening to provide for that radius. Directly across the street is South Maple Park entry, and it's, you know, shown on the site plan. But I, I guess there, there's still a concern that even if they're not turning left, it's pretty easy to, to do a quick, you know, shot directly across the street, get into that park entrance and then do a U-turn there. So I think there is really concern that you can straighten your car out if you can't get it to do a left turn to get it straight across the street. And I think that's, it still reads in terms of where that right turn lines up directly across from that park curb cut, feels like an invitation to just cross both lanes to get into that park to do a U-turn. So, I don't know if that can get shifted, you know, more to the west. It's, so it's not lined up to really make people turn right, uh, or if that starts getting into the elevation change to go over the bridge. But, you know, it really starts to look like that that's an invitation there. Um, so that would just be something that I'd like to see more that it's been investigated and confirmed that this is the only place that we're going to get that right turn in right turn out without those conflicts um the uh, a little thing um is that your all of your lighting is shoot what is it called it's not dark sky compliant it's got this funny made-up designation that the only place i could find it is in the uk as a seal it's not like a formalized dark sky lighting seal. So if you can just update, like there's a lot of dark sky registered lighting out there. It would be a very easy thing to change what you're specifying to be dark sky compliant relative to our lighting ordinance. So whatever that arbitrary seal is that you have, just switch to dark sky lighting. <laughs> It'll just make a lot of commissioners a lot happier um, in that regard. I think those were, you know, my two you know, first touch point. Oh, I guess the other one, maybe this is for staff, is parking in the stack par stacked parking in the garage garages. I think we've seen this on another project as well, but that's not been like formalized in terms of how we're counting, right? That one car is stacked into the other. So I just want to confirm how it is written in the ordinance to count the parking versus what we're seeing here. And if how it's set up in the garage as a stacked parking meets current ordinance or if we're doing that a wiggle room thing to get in those counts. I will verify. Okay. I, I can answer some of those. Okay. Um, as far as the right turn out, um, the, on the graphic you see the the current layout of that driveway we've been going back and forth with the city with actually is a little more severe of a right turn on that. So it, it kind of does force even more than what you're seeing in that visual. Um, as so far that'll as be the lighting, updated. We'll yeah, it is a little okay. bit more. We've been going back and forth with fire and traffic with a little bit different geometry and some things. And one of those things is does actually kind of, if you see the, the alignment of the driveway as you head toward Liberty, it kind of just goes straight instead of going perpendicular to Liberty there and then curves. So you're a little farther west away from that park entrance you're concerned about. So that, that will be improved a little bit on okay. that entry. Uh, regarding lighting, we'll certainly look into that. Um, and as far as the stacked parking, uh, Alexis, I think we had this conversation when we first went in with this one, and we are not allowed to, and we are not counting both parking spots under the buildings. You can't count the one that's trapped behind the other one. 
So technically they, they do have a two-car garage, but our parking count doesn't doesn't, count. doesn't allow that to be spread out. Right. Okay. That helps. Thanks. Commissioner Hammerschmidt. So I'm also concerned about the, the right turn out and I'm sure I'm gonna get shut down for this, but this might not even be allowed, but could we entertain putting like a stop light there or is that just like, I'm probably looking to staff for this. Is that just like completely, no. I'm just trying to think of options other than like having to go all the way to Wagner to turn around or cut through somebody else's neighborhood. Traffic controls, such as traffic signals and multi-way stops, they do have warrants that you have to meet, and they are established in the Michigan Manual of Uniform Traffic Control Devices. And this site um, it generally doesn't produce enough traffic to meet mm -hmm. those types of warrants. Okay, fair. I just had to ask. I I don't know what else you would do besides force people to turn right, but I tend to agree that people are gonna find a way to go left, especially being located so close to everything that's over in that like Maple Stadium area. That is it for now. Ms. Woods. I was wondering, um, because I think I remember a previous, uh, previous submittal of a project similar to this, and I was wondering whether or not the petitioner has had conversations with the surrounding properties uh, to the, I guess it would be to the north maybe, I'm not sure. But um, just looking back over along the uh, expressway back over there and I'm looking at the aerial view, which was in the staff report. So have you had any conversations? I know, um, well, two types I'm, I'm thinking about. One is in terms of any kind of an access that your residents might be able to have, but also in terms of any kinds of um, walking paths or what have you um, for your residents to be able to access some of the businesses which are which are back over there. There's a uh, well, there's Kroger's of course, but there's Westgate and and some of those things. So, can someone from the petitioners uh, team speak to that for us? Uh, certainly, uh, the developer and owner. I guess that we've we've as Alexis referred to this this been bouncing in and out of uh, the city with site plans for about five years now with with the team I'm working with, and in all cases, all developers and owners involved have talked to the owners next door and behind about access um, to no avail to this point. Um, even for pedestrian access, early on we had looked at having that path in the back connect somewhere off site but to no to no avail so efforts have been made in that regard but it hasn't gone anywhere all right seeing no other hands i think we're ready for a postponement motion mr leonard do you is there any other feedback that you're looking to get um, no, but um, I would ask uh, that I, I didn't do a good job um, and broke the cardinal rule with the previous petition. Uh, any motion to postpone should include a date. Um, do uh, does staff have a recommendation for a date? Um, I guess ultimately it would be um, Ultimately, it would be up to uh, Alexis and Cynthia as to where you feel the progress is on the um, alternate configurations of that driveway. Um, it seems to me that could be done either um, in, I would guess, either the meeting two weeks out or a month out. Um, I, I guess I would defer to you as a reviewers where you're feeling the confidence is in, in getting to a determination on, on an alternative design. Um, I know that uh, Mr. Curry has been very good um, the past couple of days. We've, um, he's on top of um, submitting the uh, revisions. Um, and I, I, 
uh, seems to be quite focused. Um, typically staff, we take two weeks to review. It's certainly possible we can do one week, um, but typically it's two. Is it possible to say something like no later than July first meeting or July second meeting? No, uh, to postpone it, we'd need to do a date certain. And uh, okay. that as anybody who's interested in this item would know exactly when it's gonna be reconsidered. I got it, yeah. Um, so, so based on well, that, I guess I, I would suggest perhaps um, our first July meeting. Yeah. Okay, will commissioner move uh, a postponement until our July 1st meeting? Moved by Commissioner Sove. do I have a second? Commissioner Hammerschmidt, thank you. Um, any discussion on postponement? Commissioner Briggs? Yeah, it's July 7th is the date of that meeting. July 7th. This is, um, I'm sorry, this is, it just took me a little bit to process what Commissioner Woods had mentioned earlier, so it's not really on the postponement, but just an extra random thought. Um, I thought that was a really good recommendation around connectivity to other sites, and I, recognizing that that's not an option, but if that could be built a little bit into the kind of low layout so that in the future that that is potentially possible for connectivity, you know, down the road would be would be really great to see. Sorry. No discussion on postponement. Thank you. Um, well, I, it, I just want to verify that date. Give me one moment, please. Yeah, scheduled for the seventh. Okay. It's been moved, seconded. I don't see any other discussion. Um, all those in favor of postponing until July 7th, please say aye. 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 Opposed? All right, it is postponed. Thank you. Uh, moving on to audience participation. Um, this is an opportunity for persons to speak for up to three minutes about any issue. City staff will select callers that have raised their hand one by one using the last three digits of your phone number. In order to electronically raise your hand uh, to indicate your desire to speak, please press star nine on your phone. You'll hear an automated announcement once the host is allowing you to speak. Please state your name and address at the beginning of your comments. Uh, do we have anybody who would like to speak? No speakers indicated. Okay. Thank you. Moving on to commission proposed business. Is there any commission proposed business this evening? Commissioner Gibrandel. I'm wondering if we have the schedule set for the next year yet in terms of our meetings. Just speaking of like kind of when the next meetings are coming up and I'm just wondering if that's been um, solidified yet. Yes, you adopted it. I, um, I think um, I think we're in the process of sending out the typical outlook uh, appointments for okay. your calendars, but, but I'll send you the summary as well. Okay, thanks. And Commissioner Briggs. I guess just on that note around um, meetings, um, has there been discussion around um, how long it's anticipated we're gonna be continuing to meet virtually? Um, uh, no status, I think, since the last time uh, I updated you, the governor's order is extends through June at this point. Um, we have, I know that there are, is interest in the city and learning from this experience. Um, I think that it's conceivable that there will be different opportunities to meet um, depending on the type of board. That is, um, there may be a different, um, there may be different flexibility for a committee versus uh, the full board or even potentially distinct from a business meeting to a working session. But I don't have, the city is not, um, um, well, let me re rephrase that. If, if those determinations about long-term possibilities have been made, I, I'm not aware of them, but I'll, I'll follow up and I'm happy to follow up with the correspondence because I know that'll, it's helpful for planning our calendar going forward. Okay, great, thanks. Thanks. Um, any other commission proposed business? Um, do I have a motion to adjourn? Moved by Commissioner um, 
and seconded by Commissioner Gabrando. We do have, um, if, if the Planning Commission is um, willing, we have had somebody indicate, raise their hand, um, if the Commission would be willing to reopen uh, the last audience participation. Sure. Yeah, okay. Hello, caller with phone number ending with 998. If you'd like to address the Planning Commission, you have three minutes to do so. Hi, my name is Chad Nitre. I live at 2534 West Liberty, uh, which is at Blue Heron Pond. And I'm sorry, I tried to call in during public comment, but it wasn't going through quick enough. So um, you have kind of addressed some of the issues that I wanted to bring up um, about this site plan. I pull out in the morning every day onto Liberty Street out of Blue Heron Pond. And when you turn left, and we're quite a ways down from the highway overpass, when you turn left there during you know school hours and, and rush hour, it's kind of like taking your life into your own hands. It's really tough to get out onto Liberty Street. And the cars come over that uh, bridge pretty quickly. So sometimes we even have to go out onto Maple to, to get out onto the um, main road because the traffic is really, really bad. So that was my concern about that development being so close to 94. Any traffic that gets added to Liberty Street, trying to come out and make left-hand turn in the morning, uh, it, it, it's gonna be really bad. So I just wanted to kind of make you aware of that. Um, the right turn that, that you're talking about could be a really good answer to that but i can see a lot of people making that left turn anyway and i can pretty much guarantee there's going to be a lot of accidents there i've seen cars already run over the curb to get out of the way when they've tried to turn out of of the blue heron pond development onto liberty and a car comes that they didn't see and they literally will go over the curb across the street to get out of the way at times so that, that's just the comments i wanted to make on that uh, that's all i really have great Thank you very much for calling in. All right, um, we are, our uh, German has been moved and seconded. Um, do I have our, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 All right, we are adjourned. Thank you very much. Aye, thank you. Bye. Everybody.